Um, so uh, as I said, welcome everybody. The panelists and myself cannot see you, but we are aware of your presence. Uh, just know that. Uh, it's a little bit disorienting speaking like this without seeing you, but we know we know you are here. We have a fantastic lineup today uh, of speakers. We will be begin with uh, Elena Staiku, who will talk to us about the importance of nitrogen and the kind of elemental philosophical imagination. Then Howard Cagle will speak of the little known project by Robert Smithson which revealed the climatic future toward which we are heading. And finally, Johan Tom and Wayne Biniti will enact performance talk in three fragments on the effects of drilling and sampling of ice core through philosophical and physical uh, reflections. Each speaker, speaker will present 30 minutes um, and then we will have 15 minutes for questions uh, which I ask you to write in the Q&A box rather than the chat uh, thread. You can find that Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I will read those question, uh, questions aloud so that everyone, everyone can hear them, even if you do not uh, see them. Okay. Um, again, thank you for being here still. Um, we will start now with uh, uh, Elena and her presentation. Go ahead, Elena. <clears throat> You're frozen. You're frozen, Elena. We can't. I wonder if we can stop the recording for now or pause it. What we looked in the nitrogen imperative uh, follows on from a lecture I gave in uh, 2021 as part of the Ideas Sphere lecture series on the Anthropocene Either or organized by George Smith and Simonetta uh, Moro with the title Thinking the Nitrogen Anthropocene. Perhaps it would be a good starting point to give some context and reflect on the change of wording and framing between these two titles and occasions from the Nitrogen Anthropocene to the Nitrogen Imperative. The Nitrogen Anthropocene referred to the environmental and social impact of the human manipulation and excessive disruption of the nitrogen cycle that since the early 20th centuries, centuries happening on an industrial scale and responded to a call for a more situated, critical and diversified understanding of the Anthropocene as the proposed geological name for the epoch following the Holocene and characterized by the irremediably anthropogenic terraforming activity on this planet. Catherine Yusuf's Milestone 2018 book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes on None, unearthed the colonial, extractivist, and racialized grammar and logics of the science of geology in its inception, and underscored the urgency of knowing and discerning under the general heading of the Anthropocene, its countless histories of violence and exploitation, its varied forms of injustice, and even experience of harm and damage, as well as the histories and potentials of geological insurgents. The Nitrogen Anthropocene asked why are not nitrogen greenhouse gas emissions as urgent a subject of public debate as CO2 and methane emissions. What is it that even in studies and reports on the contribution of industrial agriculture as one of the main drivers of climate change, the focus falls more on CO2 emissions, the carbon anthropocene, and less on the nitrogen challenge? These questions and the answers are and must be inextricably linked to the countless histories and forms of gendered 
racialized and environmental violence, for example, the social and agricultural experiment known as the Green Revolution, a misleading name according to ecofeminist critic and agroecology activist Vantana Shiva given to a chemical-based agricultural model that was exogenously imposed in India and particularly in the Punjab region in the 1960s as a result of the expansion of the synthetic fertilizer industry in the West. While the Anthropocene might stay with us, 2024 will be the year when scientists on the formal proposal of the Anthropocene group, Working Group to declare this new geochronological unit although the specificity of its beginning is still fiercely debated and its impact is said to have now extended even beyond the Earth as its planetary unit all the way to the Moon, altering lunar surface, the use of this term as a critical concept and ecopolitical tool seems to have run its course and is already showing signs of fatigue. While scientists lean towards the specificity of geologic timescale and localization of what is assumed holistically as a new geological era, criticism of the Anthropocene paradigm such as Yusuf's, which unveil its continuity with colonial and extractivist logics and practices, have brought this critical term near exhaustion. This is also due to its strange convoluted temporality as trope or imaginary. Geologist and paleontologist Jan Jalazewicz, who is a member of the Anthropocene Working Group, in his 2008 book, The Earth After Us, What Legacy Will Humans Leave in the Rocks?, asks the hundred million years question that will have characterized an entire epoch compressed, sentimented, and having no more than the stratigraphic thickness of a piece of cigarette paper. And it's strictly geolo geological, Definition and timescale, the Anthropocene refers to a fossil in the stratigraphic record that will be clearly detectable in the Earth's deep future af long after the sixth extinction event, and who knows how many more will have been completed. The present question would be, what fossilization potential will the human civilization or empire have materialized? Thinking the Anthropocene in terms of extinction and a human futures may well lead to action or inaction while retaining in either case the character of a speculative and self-referential gesture, which is, as Maria Grech has argued in her recent book, Spectrality and Survivance Living the Anthropocene, a future retrovision unmistakably structured by a rhetoric of redemption that remains centered on the existence of an anthropomorphic gaze and is still not critical or troubled enough by the attitudes, worldviews, social and environmental injustice and inaction, denial and resignation that are driving and precipitating that future fossilization. In truth, what needs to be precipitated is the deconstruction or rather decomposition of a certain yet dominant understanding and praxis of being human, the human as burner and maker of fossils. Before hurling ourselves into the nitrogen cascade, I would like to put forward a speculated fiction inspired by but different to that of Zalazovitz in The Earth After Us. Zalazovitz entertained there the hypothesis of science fiction of an expedition team of extraterrestrial explorers, or perhaps of a newly evolved terrestrial hyperintelligence species that hit upon a remarkable stratum deeply buried in the earthly rock some hundred million years from now. The expedition team is quickly convinced that this accelerating geological finding has a deep significance and is most probably the trace and evidence of a short-lived but sophisticated civilization with the capacity to re-engineer part of the planet's surface. The more distinctly a fossil stratum appears in the geologic record, geologists tells us, tell us, the more sudden and calamitous the extinction event of its producers would have been, the clearer the evidence of an abrupt end of an era on a planet 
that rapidly became hostile. My own speculative fiction is not about extinction and the distant future, but it also involves a team of extraterrestrial explorers with expertise in geobiochemistry who have taken an interest in the intricate and enticing synergy between geological, biological, and elemental processes on Earth. The year is 2024, when the team of exogeobiochemists are on their second expedition to the planet. The first had occurred some 10,000 years ago and had yielded some exciting findings with revolutionary potential. The gathered information concerned the beginnings of an experiment now known as agriculture in various regions of the planet, that is a systematic and intensive, albeit limited in scope, domestication by humans of a handful of plant and animal species, as well as of soil, water, air, and fire. The expedition team left the Earth well wishing and correctly predicting that this would be an irreversible event in the history of the planet that would result in the development of complex social structures, the alteration of compositional arrangements of matter and landscape systems, and of relationships among and between humans and non-human forms of life. In 2024, as the team approached the Earth for its second expedition, they were forewarned by the noticeable change in the hue of the planet's watery surface from blue to green, a sign that something was up. There was definitely something in the air. What they saw arriving on Earth was beyond their most bold predictions and speculations. They marvel marveled at the accomplishments and artifacts of the human civilization and their geoengineering capacity, which was now catching up with the ingenuity of bacterial technology. They were astonished at the scale of migration and intermingling of plant, animal, microbial, and human life across the continents, something that had begun, as they found out, over four centuries ago, according to the human timeline, in the aftermath of an event called the Columbian, Columbian Exchange. They were impressed by the exponential increase of the human population, along with their domesticated species, which had exploded only the last few decades and had reached 8 billion the year before. This could have meant only one thing. There must have been a revolutionary and epoch-changing breakthrough in the nature of human metabolism. They were quickly led to the conclusion that humans must have come up with an extremely efficient way of artificially fixing and industrially producing reactive forms of nitrogen, a miraculous way of harvesting unprecedentedly large amounts of nitrogen from the atmosphere. As experts in earthly geobiochemistry, they knew that one of the principles of the discipline designated that biological innovations occurred near to where first needed, according to the selective pressures determined by the availability and limitation of nutrients. It remained to be seen what the advantages and the cost of this new metabolic pathway were. I will interrupt this short fiction here. Of course, it is not in any way scientific speculation like Zalazevich's, the data and pattern based prediction of an expert in earthly matters. It serves a different purpose and responds to a different imperative to refocus our attention and steer our imagination towards directions that have been neglected in our time of carbon imaginary, as Elizabeth Povinelli had called it. The human manipulation of nitrogen cycling through terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems since the beginning of the 20th century, and especially after the 1950s Great Acceleration, has scaled up to the massive industrialized extraction of these elements' reactive forms for industrial, agricultural, and military purposes. This has resulted in the alteration of the nitrogen cycle to an unprecedented extent. And as the European Nitrogen Assessment reports, much more than that of carbon or phosphorus. The excessive deposition of nitrogen on land and water, mainly through its use of compounds such as ammonia in synthetic fertilizers, results in the emission of nitrous oxide, 
a powerful greenhouse, greenhouse gas with a long lifetime and strong infrared absorption, which means, as Dave Ray, an expert in carbon management, explains that over a hundred year time horizon, each tone of nitrous oxide emitted has a global warming potential equivalent to releasing 300 tons of carbon dioxide. Apart from this direct contribution to human-induced climate change, nitrogen pollution causes legions of extremely harmful and destabilizing effects in the environment, what has been called nitrogen cascade, a phenomenon that is poorly understood and extremely difficult to manage. The anthropogenic conversion of the nitrogen cycle into a cascade, and I will go into its basic mechanisms in a moment, is a story that is not as widely known as it should. It's imperative, imperatives not listened to enough. While the nitrogen research community is expanding and initiatives for more integrated global policies on the twin issues of the nitrogen challenge and climate change are growing, the nitrogen imaginary has not yet taken hold in public awareness and debate. When the climate impact of methane and other greenhouse gas considered more potent than CO2 was officially recognized at the COP26 summit in 2021, it was hailed as a truth finally accepted and as an encouraging sign that climate scientists were finally beginning to be heard by the governments of the world. Nitrogen, however, is still most often categorized as a non-CO2 gas and is yet to step out of the shadow of its famous fellow periodic element and enter the global agenda. There is still no official acknowledgement in intergovernmental panels of the climatological imperative that the excessive and inefficient use of chemical fertilizers in industrial agriculture has created by tipping the nitrogen cycle widely out of balance. It remains what science writer Andrew Zaleski called it in 2021, a forgotten environmental crisis. But why? Why is nitrogen, which Mark Sutton, the chief author of the European Nitrogen Assessment, has called the godfather of pollution, still in the shadows? Sutton was the head of a UN-backed project to develop an international nitrogen management system whose aim was to do for nitrogen what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had, had done for CO2. As he and his colleagues quickly realized, asking the world to cut nitrogen use in agriculture would meet a lot of resistance, notably from the powerful fertilizer industry, and so they opted to call for nitrogen waste, waste to be cut instead. This led to the Columbia Declaration in 2019, which launched the UN Global Campaign on Sustainable Nitrogen Management, a roadmap map for halving nitrogen waste by 2030, signed only by a handful of nations, not including the USA or the UK. There's more to consider than lack of political will, and the nitrogen challenge is extremely complicated as it is completely tied up to our food systems. The godfather of pollution is, of course, no more a villain than carbon is. Carbon and nitrogen together with Hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur are the essential ingredients to life. They are us. All life on this planet is said to be carbon-based, as carbon is the most abundant element in the biosphere, while nitrogen is the key building block to the DNA and RNA of all living organisms, a vital component of every single cell in our bodies, which without it, they would be incapable of synthesizing proteins, growing tissues, and maintaining themselves. We get nitrogen from our food, and all nutri nutrition in general depends on this element's biospheric cycle. Its movement out of the atmosphere, atmosphere's enormous reserve, making up 78 of its volume, into soil, water, biomass, and then out again. The availability of nitrogen and thus the life it can sustain is limited in its natural cycling because in its abundant form, 
nitrogen is an unusually stable, inert, and non-reactive element. It can only be used and taken up by ecosystems. Once it is converted into more useful forms, compounds with weaker chemical bonds, such as ammonia, nitrate, nitrite, what is called reactive nitrogen. Atmospheric nitrogen likes to keep to itself and to its extremely strong triple bond binding its two atoms together. It takes the energy of lightning to sever them apart or the ingenuity of bacteria called nitrifiers in the soil and water which have developed the molecular scissors to cut through these bonds and make nourishing compounds out of the air. This process is called biofixation and until the beginning of the 20th century had not been carried out but by any other living organism. A different type of bacteria, the denitrifiers, turn back the used up nutrients, the products of metabolism and decomposition of dead bodies into atmospheric nitrogen, completing the cycle. Nitrous oxide, the potent greenhouse gas, major driver of climate change and ozone depletion in the stratosphere, is a byproduct of denitrification. The story of nitrogen as we know it goes back to its discovery by chemists at the end of the 18th century and its identification as a nutrient a few decades later. Since then, chemists had been trying to synthesize ammonia in the lab with no success and by the end of the 19th century, while the industrialized and urbanized world was rapidly expanding and as many reserves such as guano over which European colonial powers had fiercely fought were becoming scarce, the imperative to synthesize artificially ammonia seemed existential. The breakthrough came from Germany when the German Jewish chemist Fritz Haber finally accomplished nitrogen fixation in the lab in 1909 in a way that could be scaled up to the industrial production of fertilizers, something which was materialized three, four years later by the engineer Carl Boss. What is known as the Harbor Boss process for Mark Carlton, perhaps the greatest single experiment in global geoengineering that humans have ever made was released into the world. Even so, we don't usually acknowledge the fact that it is most certainly thanks to this not that famous process, which led to a spectacular increase in food productivity followed by the exponential growth of the human population that most of us are here today. Artificial nitrogen fixation overcame the limitations that biofixation imposed on the cultivation of crops, but the human manipulation of nitrogen and the excessive deposition of fertilizer in the soils and waters have led to the disruption of a balanced billions of years in the making, in the arrangement, synergy, and cycling of elements, and of natural experiments in composition and decomposition. Human metabolism in the 20th and 21st centuries might have leaped over a gigantic geobiological hurdle or selective pressure, but it is by no means on top of what it has initiated. Microorganisms are still at the heart of this transformation and as Dave Ray points out, they play a crucial role in the global nitrogen cycle and its many interactions with climate change. Nitrogen Cascade names the run of effects of anthropogenic nitrogen fixation which are mainly caused by the excessive and mismanaged use of chemical fertilizers in global agriculture, the leaching of reacting nitrogen into soils, waterways, forests, and oceans with its legion knock-on effects like acidification, algal blooms, and eutrophication, which by altering trophic relationships creates competitive advantages for some species causing starvation and suffocation for others since it ruptures the tight web of geobiochemical interconnectedness in ecosystems. Nitrogen cascade is so hard to manage, not only because of the fierce resistance of agribusiness corporate interests to change and with politi weak political 
will, but also because it is a phenomenon that is too complex to understand and needs joint and concerted efforts on so many intertwined levels. What the nitrogen imperative asks us to change above all is the way we participate in the nitrogen flow. What I would like to do for the rest of this lecture is to bring this emergency in touch with recent approaches to elemental theory and with some examples from ecocritical philosophy and ecopolitical art. Elements compose and decompose. They bind together and break apart. Elements oblige. Nitrogen obliges us to see ourselves immersed in its story and cycle. How did it ever come? How did we ever come to believe that we could step out of it, objectify, and control it? Wait, not everyone believes so. This is a belief and a historical shift that's recognized in the self-presentation of the new man, the Western bourgeoisie liberal on a humanist, to quote Sylvia Winter's description, the image of man in general. This was figuration work already a storytelling that charted a culture-specific mode of human being as isomorphic with reason in general. This was what agriculturist Vandana Shiva protested against the Green Revolution and the chemical plantation agriculture it imposed identified as a violent knowledge paradigm that institutionalized a mechanistic worldview which tore the human species away from its vital entanglement and deep reciprocity with the more than human. It is time to reactivate or listen to other kinds of storytelling, to learn from other modes of human being and from thinking with the elements. In the introduction to elemental ecocriticism, thinking with earth, air, water and fire, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen and Lowell Duckert think of the classical elements as apprehensible environmental agents, as climat climatic, as well as corporeal and diegetic forces and are material, that are materially and ethically binding, capable of bonding materially and materiality and narrative in ways that hold us irremediably within a swilled mess of obligation. To be able to perceive environmental agency in earth air, water, and fire, what David Macaulay in Elemental Philosophy, Earth, Air, Fire, and Water as Environmental Ideas, has called the restoration of the elements, constitutes for Cohen and Darkett a strategic anthropomorphism allied with the elements, whose goal is to decenter the human form the human from its accustomed universal midpoint. But their approach to the elemental and their choice of perspective leaves out the intangible connections conducted by chemical elements that are difficult to deploy as a means of intensifying environmental consciousness in favor of the perceivable foundations of which worlds are composed the four classical elements as agencies that are perceivable to the naked human eye and at a scale that is roughly familiar, nearly human, in duration and extension, end of quote. I admit having trouble seeing how the elements can be scaled down to the human sense of time and space outside a Kantian legislative and transcendental framing of the a priori forms of experience. To enter the nitrogen imaginary, however, one is obliged to go beyond what the eye perceives, to attune oneself to imperceivable movements and rhythms of matter, to learn to be attentive to the ways, as Stefan Helmreich urges, cosmological and molecular elementalities and our accounts of them mix and rearrange each other, and to begin again against Kant, thinking across impossible to experience scales in aesthetico ethical or as Maria Puig de la Bella Casa proposes, poetical speculation and reimagining our relationship to our elemental commons. 
This would take thinking with elements across multiple scales and of the way they index diverse configurations of time and space, as well as manners of habitation. The imperative of a new transcendental aesthetic that, as Derrida urged in Of Grammatology, must let itself be guided not only by mathematical or chemical, let's add, idealities, but by the possibility of inscription, recalling to that element, stichion in Greek, also means engraved line and letter, as habitation always already situated. How do we then enter the nitrogen imaginary? How might we reinscribe or reimagine the ways in which nitrogen has been fixed or redistributed as synthetic and industrial chemical that is now saturating soil, water, and air in its situated semio ecochemical entanglements and interlacement in stories? that obliges us to pay attention. The nitrogen imaginary, an imperative as ethical, ethical reactivation of this element, takes its cue from Pobinelli's carbon imaginary that she associates with the figure of the desert and evokes as the diagnostic tool of a certain biocentrism at the age of late liberal governance and climate change of a life forgetful of its material and elemental entanglement and obligation on the verge of extinction and in terror-stricken search to renew the conditions for its own sustainment. I would like to associate the nitrogen imaginary with the figure of the harvest that gathers stories where land-community relationships have been ruptured by chemical violence and those spawn from within what Robin Wall Kimmerer calls in Braden Sweetgrass, the honorable harvest, the traditional ecological knowledge and land care practices of indigenous harvesters that are rich in prescriptions for sustainability. There are stories obliging us to view the nitrogen emergency and its cascading effects, not solely through the lens of technoscientific assessment, but in connection with the perturbation of its meaningful and nurturing entanglement with the life it supports. Are we not obliged by the stories and actions of the women of the Chipko movement from Himalaya villages in northern Indian, captured in the emblematic documentary photographs by Pamela Zing in 1994? And I really wish I had my PowerPoint because uh, I would show, but uh, hopefully uh, most of you know this work. Um, it's quite emblematic. Um, it's the women that, in order to protect uh, uh, the trees from my loggers, uh, uh, embrace them and create uh, human seals around them. Um, I can share the PowerPoint at, at, at a, a later point. Um, the women continuing a tradition of peaceful calm and defined resistance are embracing the, the trees, their life lives are attached to to protect them from the loggers of agribusiness and development. Are not stories of the honorable harvest, the forest community relationship and its violent and catastrophic disruption interlocked in this tender embrace? These photographs were part of a recent exhibition at the Barbican Centre in London called Re Sisters, a lens of gender and ecology. Well, Byzantine it a few months ago, I recalled how James Galloway, the chemist who proposed the notion of nitrogen cascade, had concluded an article on the wicked problem of nitrogen management, suggesting that citizens in the more developed world have the opportunity to lead the way by example and knowledge. Do agrarian communities in the global south, especially women whose livelihood is the forest, the river, the lake, the land, needs to be educated by scientific assessment and mobilized by environmental campaigns in the West on the effects of deforestation and the reduction of biodiversity to know what it all means for them. If attention had been given to the struggles and testimonies from the localities and communities first affected by the perturbation of ecosystem integrity, perhaps we would have been forewarned about the impending global cascade. If only climate justice mattered as much, 
us and was inseparable to climate change mitigation. I would like to finish with a question of positionality. The Barbican also hosted exhibits from Agnes Dean's 1982 landmark, landmark series, Whitfield, a confrontation, Battery Park, Landfill, downtown Manhattan. I'm sure, I hope, because I don't have the images, you are familiar with this iconic work and perhaps um, some of the controversy around it. Placing two acres of wheat at the foot of the World Trade Center aimed to question the status quo to intrude into the citadel of finance capital and bring attention to mismanagement, waste, world hunger and ecological concerns by turning a dirty landfill to topsoil for farming. And the images of course, are extremely uh, uh, powerful. So there are two acres of, uh, uh, of wheat right next uh, uh, to the twin uh, towers, um, which were cultivated and uh, then harvested. And some criticism of this work uh, viewed in the concert that was visualized so powerfully a lack of attention to the colonial history of this industrial cereal crop, which had to be fertilized through the use of synthetic nitrogen. In other words, what kind of harvest was it? What position does it take in the nitrogen imaginary? Questioning our positionality, especially if it is one of privilege, perhaps involves the audacity of confrontation, unless the brave and calm defiance that just wants to let to hold on. But even more than the necessity of confrontation, what we are obliged to following the lead of artists, and now I, I would share uh, images uh, of uh, artists like Anna uh, Mendienta and Fina Mirales and uh, Yuria, um, uh, images where the immerse, they immerse themselves uh, um, uh, in, in landscapes. Um, anyway, these are extremely powerful um, and suggestive uh, images. So my point is, you know, we could follow the lead um, of those artists to rediscover our relationship to the elements, seeing ourselves immersed, reintegrated in their materialities and flows, or as Maria Puig de la Pelacaza suggests, to reconceive ourselves as part of the process of elemental cycling and breakdown, to include ourselves in the definitions of communities of soil and the renewal of ecological affinities. To do this, we must be open to learn from those who never let go, even when they were violently dispossessed and displaced. Reimagining our relationship and affinity to the elements also means re-indigenizing ourselves to resonate Sylvia Winter's powerful analysis in Black Metamorphosis of the creation of a native culture in a strange land in the context of the Middle Passes. One of the principles of geopiochemistry is that innovations occur near to where first needed. Life emerges as a planetary response to the flow of energy, releasing itself from its mineral dependency wherever an activation barrier was lowered, allowing for chemical reactivity, conversion of metal clusters into organic forms and their di diversification. This imperative is our elementary freedom and our responsibility, the way we are obliged to this microbial planet. To maintain ourselves on it, we need not construct construct universalities, but embrace all kinds of experimentation, breakdowns, and decompositions in diversity. It's time to wrap up and go. Our team of exogeobiochemists are living, renewing the rendezvous for 10,000 years from now. Looking at this paler blue dot from afar, they are wondering what on earth would the human species come up with next time? Will they learn to be wise enough to be still around? Till then, it's goodbye and good luck. That's it. And uh, really sorry I couldn't share the, the images uh, and the quotes uh, you could have read there. Uh,
Yes, um, thank you, Elena. Maybe we can share those uh, images and slides um, in the aftermath. Uh, there's already a question in the chat uh, for people that would love to see the references that you mentioned and and the yes. images. Okay. Yes. We'll do our best to share to share those with you. Is that okay? Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Well try to work it out uh, even before we finish the webinar Excellent. no problem no problem so i'll i'll let a uh, couple of questions uh, uh be asked and then um i think we already contacted howard because we have another presenter in south africa with 15 blocks of ice that are melting uh we were wondering if we can go to him uh, before yeah. howard Howard will have 45 minutes to for transition. Is that okay? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So uh, we have a question here from for you, Elena, from David Beasley. A great presentation. A nitrogen imaginer would foundationally seem to need to implicitly be linked to speculate on present social political structures to that of socialism to capitalism capitalism, a value for life over profit. I would argue this is the main narrative that needs exploration to ecological knowledge for speculative discourse. As human needs need to be linked to an ingrained capitalist hegemony where praxis might have a greater chance of arguing for change, is exposing the dialectical other for differing social political structures. I'd love to know your thoughts on this to spec speculative fiction for praxis. So the relationship of speculative fiction to to social political context, I guess. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. Thank you, uh, David. And I think, you know, in, in a way, this is what I'm also trying to do, but I, I brought in uh, uh, the scientific discourse uh, on uh, um, on, on the nitrogen and nitrogen uh, uh, emergency, because I, I think in order for that to have uh, political consequences, we must understand better what is nitrogen, what is a nitrogen uh, uh, cycle, how we are part of it, how we are immersed uh, uh, of it. So our, our relationship with the elements is also uh, apart from the geobiological, chemical uh, 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 connection, which is vital. It, it's a it's who we are. It's what we are. Uh, it's also something that obliges us ethically, and of course also uh, uh, politically. And some of uh, uh, the thinkers have been uh, uh, drawing uh, on, like Elizabeth Bobinelli and Sylvia uh, 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 Winter, whose work. Um, of course, uh, uh, involves a criticism of uh, governmentality. Uh, in winter, there is a, a, a Marxist uh, uh, background, and uh, 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 the the critique, and you know, with the, with you, the demolition of uh, of capitalism as something that is, of course, indissociable uh, uh, from uh, colonialism. Um, um, imperialism and and uh, 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 all kinds of uh, 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 exploitation of human, um, which is insociable from, uh, of course, the damage to to the environment. So uh, all these things are uh, inextric inextricably uh, related, and we need. Also, those speculative uh, uh, fictions, uh, uh, those uh, uh, approaches um, to enlarge uh, our awareness uh, 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 of them. So I, I think uh, definitely uh, what needs to be, be done is this interdisciplinary um, connection uh, when it comes to to the issue uh, of uh, of nitrogen, uh, with an astute awareness that uh, this uh, um, 
has political consequences and it is embedded um, um, in those uh, uh, political um, uh, terrains. Uh, um, and, and a lot of things I, uh, I, I touched upon uh, uh, and, and the scientists are drafting uh, uh, reports and assessments uh, uh, for recommendations to intergovernmental uh, 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 panels to take action on these uh, issues and the kind of resistances uh, they are confronting um, are completely interlocked uh, uh, with uh, um, politics, uh, uh, of, of course, and uh, um, capitalism, and uh, uh, transnational financial uh, lobbies and interests. So uh, everything, everything uh, uh, is uh, interconnected, and there has to be this this shift uh, in our awareness and and um, consciousness uh, of that interconnectedness. And this, this is why I think uh, uh, that art that looks at uh, these issues and can change our perception uh, of them uh, uh, is also such a vital component um, um, of this effort. Thank you, Lena. One more question, and then we'll move on uh, to South Africa. And this is a question from Professor Bruce Glavovich, who presented last uh, Friday on climate uh, science in action and the necessities for the interdisciplinary work that you al are aligned with. It's the same question that I wanted to pose, namely a week ago, a the committee of geologists uh, officially rejected Anthropocene as a term. I don't know if you are aware of that. Uh, so geologists will not use that as a legitimate term anymore. Oh, okay because they cannot decide the start date uh, of when this event actually starts. They cannot. So uh, the question is, how does this decision align with your thesis? Or you know, what, what is your opinion on that kind of official rejection of the term Anthropocene? Uh, OK, th thank you for that. Uh, uh... I mean, the last thing I had checked uh, uh, was that it, it was still debated and there was a lot of uh, uh, disagreement and uh, people um, um, resigning from uh, the Anthropocene Working Group because they thought that mm. uh, like in, in Canada was uh, too uh, a narrow uh, uh, point of uh, uh, beginning for the, uh, the Anthropocene. Uh, and that perfectly aligns with what I was saying, because uh, uh, there are so many problems beyond what uh, geologists and scientists think about, about uh, the correctness of uh, such a, a term defining a, a, a geological uh, epoch. The Anthropocene as a critical uh, uh, term, uh, um, uh, I feel, has reached this kind of uh, exhaustion for things that are mentioned in uh, 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 for reasons that are mentioned in the in the lecture um relating to the anthropocentric uh, uh, gaze and uh, uh, the strong uh, um, tendency to anthropomorphize so it still puts um the human and in the sense that Sylvia uh, Winter criticizes the, the monohumanist uh, at the center of, uh, of uh, everything. And it, it also urges for, for this uh, uh, technological fix to, to the problem. Uh, so my perspective uh, is that we need to look how uh, climate change and uh, uh, environmental uh, um, uh, damage um, it's affecting locally, uh, ecosystems, uh, communities, um, and that if we don't have a more developed sense of uh, uh, climate uh, justice, I don't think we'll be able, we will never be able to to address uh, this uh, this uh, challenge. Um, so this is what uh, the nitrogen uh, imperative. Uh, um, 
wants to do, wants to, to join this uh, uh, effort, we need to know what are the effects, what are the consequences on a local uh, uh, level, uh, see what is happening to those communities. And this is why the art, which is always so situated, uh, um, uh, it's a very uh, powerful visual uh, tool uh, to do that. Um, so I'm not surprised uh, and I'm not dismayed at all that uh, uh, the Anthropocene as a term uh, uh, has been rejected. Uh, it's an extremely problematic term. Excellent, brilliant. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, I will leave your screen now and go to the site-specific art uh, representation. Uh, in light of what you were saying, if at the end we find the time and find you, we have a few more questions for you, but this yeah. may or may not happen. Uh, Howard will then jo jump in in 45 minutes or so. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And I, will, I can stop your video too. Okay, so now um, we're going to to uh, our next two presenters, Wayne Beniti, who is in London, and Johan Tom, who is in uh, South Africa um, at the Nerox Foundation, which is between Pretoria and Johannesburg, I believe, uh, and who dragged 15 blocks of ice uh, in order to uh, do a performative talk for us. Uh, do you want to start with the video first? Or, Johan, do you want to jump in immediately? You can go with the video first. It's fine. Thank you. And when you're ready, please just unmute me, will you? I will, certainly. Thank you. Okay. Let me share the screen. When do you want to say a line about the video? Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, one of the things... Um, we're dealing with here is the complexity of, of these issues and um, one of the methods that we'd like to talk about today is, is maybe looking at this you know definitions and language of what we mean when we say climate and what we what, what, and, and the, the connection to atmosphere um, one of the methods we're going to talk about today is of drilling into the very core the very essential part of the discussion which happens to be the air, tiny bubbles of air trapped inside ice. So we're gonna show a little film about that, which was recorded at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. Brilliant, thank you.
this is the snippet that we wanted to show you. Now we'll go to Johan Tom in South Africa, who will recite a set of literary fragments. And <laughs> Johan, I cannot unmute you myself. You will have to unmute yourself, Johan. Here we go. Perfect. At certain times, the human being is a plant that desires water from the sky. Water always flows, falls, ends in horizontal death. Death is associated with water. The pain of water is infinite. Water is a universal home. It peoples the sky with its fish. A symbiosis of images give the birds to the deep and the fish to the firmament. The touch of a finger, the slightest stain, can arouse its anger. One drop of water creates a world and dissolves the night. Images of matter are dimmed substantially and intimately. They have weight. They constitute a heart. Only water can sleep and all the while keep its beauty. Only water can die, be still, and keep its reflections. It is not knowledge that makes us love that makes us love reality. It is feeling. The first and fundamental value we begin by loving nature without knowing it. We search for its details because we love it at a distance. 
all the while without knowing why. Water, as they say in the outdated chemistry text, moderates the other elements. By destroying dryness, it is the conqueror of fire. More than the hammer, it destroys the land. It softens substances. It is a universal glue. Written language, fixed words on call tables acquire more authority than the re-evocation -evo of fluid, of fluid, living speech, consciousness. Lacking the metaphor alphabet, Consciousness had to be reimagined as a stream full of treasures. Each utterance was a piece of driftwood, fished from a river or a stream, cast off in the beyond that had just then washed into the beaches of the mind. The lake takes all of the light and makes a world of it. The eye of the earth is water. In our eyes, it is water that dreams. Claudel says, water is the gaze of the earth. It is our instrument for looking and finding. Everything in the universe is an echo. If the birds are the first creators of sound who also inspired men, they themselves imitated nature's voices. All the sounds of natural scenes. Still life animated. Have their echo and their counterpart in living nature. Circulation is as new and fundamental an idea as gravitation, evolution, or sexuality. Around 1750, wealth and money begin to circulate, and they are spoken of as liquids. After the French Revolution, ideas, newspapers, information, traffic, air, all circulate. In the city, water ought circulate to wash it of its excrement and waste.
follow dream waters upstream. Distinguish the vast register of their voices. The H2O that gurgles through our cities is not water, but stuff made by industrial society. First woman of oral tradition is forgetting, uh, is forgotten. Memosign becomes a technical term for memory. Now imagine there's a page. The stuff of memory turns from water into a shard. As soon as I say that I have come to know something, I have already kept my distance from it. I have looked at it, searched for it, figured the right angle to approach it, reached out for it, and finally grasped it. The process and progress of my thinking are already spatial metaphors. They are to be found within me. Thank you, Tom. We will now move on to fragment three, back to London, to Wayne Beniti, who will articulate the method of drilling and sampling below the Antarctic surface to relocate the ice core sample of the oldest fresh water on Earth to the Nerox Foundation. Um, hello, everyone. Um, just a few words. Johan and I were um, students together at the Slade School of Fine Art back in another geological period, 2008, I believe. And uh, we've been talking since then about this idea of, of matter and meaning. And um, one of the things that we want to share with you today is a, is a, is a piece that we're working on called Never Let You Go, 
which discusses the impossibility of let, never being able to let go of something loved or some someone or something loved. And um, in this context, we want to um, share with you um, this kind of method that we've been thinking about, that the complexity of the climate discourse is such, and it's, it's so ubiquitous, we see it everywhere. We very rarely feel it or very rarely get to understand it. One of the, one of the methods that we thought, we'd look at some fragments um, and, and maybe smaller things that are not so all apocalyptic or all encompassing. Um, part of that method, it was derived from the, the thinker Walter Benjamin uh, and Gaston Bachelard. Um, in Benjamin's introductory essay, Illuminations, um, political philo philosopher Hannah Arendt argues that Benjamin's literary method of drilling operated through the sustained and poetic use of quotation. And she argued that this constitutes a political mode of action and literary investigation in its own right. Quote, this very fact distinguishes his writings from scholarly works of all kinds, in which it is the function of quotations to verify and document opinions, wherefore they can be safely relegated to notes. This is out of the question for Benjamin. This collective work was not an accumulation of excerpts intended to facilitate writing, but constituted the main work, end quote. The, co the introduction the section of Arendt's essay in Illuminations is called The Pearl Diver, and it opens with a quotation itself from Shakespeare's Tempest. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones a coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. The father whose coral bones lie beneath the waves becomes a corporal fragment of history, and Arendt builds onto the metaphor to describe Benjamin's method of drilling into the literary fragments of the past. Arendt posits Benjamin as the pearl diver who plucks buried treasure from the seabed. In counterpoint to Arendt's sea-changed treasures, my particular research argues that the value of ice core laboratories and ice itself contains unspoken narratives, both real and imagined, which can be heard, seen, and felt in the depths of the Arctic and, and, and Antarctic. Using audiovisual methods of sampling and remixing, the research explored three states of polar matter. So I'd like to um, ask um, Dejan to uh, share with you um, three exhibitions that um, I've explored this kind of notion that Bachelard was talking about of matter and his argument that um, images of matter, including the earth, air, fire, and water, facilitate a zone of active imagination where human experience is transformed into something deeper, more profound than, um, than, than, than data or, or statistics alone. Um, so when you're ready, Dejan, it'd be great to see um, the first um, image, if possible. Yes, I, I started sharing. And you should right. be able to see it. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at um, is, is a particular start of, of this kind of thinking, um, which happened in the sub-Arctic Iceland. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a travel award um, to go to Iceland in 2013. Um, and this was maybe the beginning of a journey into uh, um, the question of how um, history is written, read, and erased in polar ice. This is the Yokusalon Glacial Lagoon. It's essentially a graveyard of, of ice. And what you're looking at is one of the largest um, formations of ice in, 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 in Northern Europe. Um, and just before they washed out into the violent rush of the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean, um, I was able to capture a series of photographs um, um, in which at this particular point, um, I was really interested in, in this sort of materiality of, 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 of water itself. Here you can see the three states of water in, in their solid, liquid and gaseous um, state. If you could show the next image, please. 
Um, at the time, I thought they were naturally carved sculptural forms. So from a sculptural point of view, I found them fascinating. If you can look, you might be able to see traces of volcanic ash trapped in the ice. Next image, please. Next image, please. These photographs were um, shortlisted for the Pre-Pictet Environmental Photography Prize. But I, I, I was stunned by that because actually at this particular point, I was actually um, curious as to, as to the crystalline formation of, of, of ice itself. Um, and, and there was an aesthetic beauty to the images. But what I was curious to, 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 to really understand is what caused these crystalline formations, which I um, will talk about later. Next image, please. Thank you, Dejan. There you can see the volcanic ash, which was caused by ancient eruptions from below the surface of this particular glacial lagoon. Next image, please, Dejan. Thank you. And here's the final one in this photographic series. Okay. Um, on my return from Iceland, um, I was curious to know as to what was the what was what you know what was I looking at in Iceland and what what caused this history to to be written, read, and erased in this way. And I got in contact with the British Antarctic Survey who uh, very generously invited me and gave me some some answers to my questions. Um, one of the curious things I found out was that the ice retains trapped volumes of ancient air from which it was possible to um, not only measure but predict um, the uh, past, present and future formations of the earth. And so here I am um, experimenting with um, the release of some of that ancient air, which is trapped in tiny bubbles of ice. As you can see here, I've got a condenser microphone. And I'm experimenting with how that could be recorded in some way, because I was interested in the acoustic properties of the carbon dioxide and the methane, which of course is used to scientifically measure climate. So this idea of, of this beginning of this method of drilling perhaps into these fragments of, of, of the geological past began in, in these early beginnings. Uh, next image, please, Deja. So here, for example, is a tiny fragment which arrived in a metal canister but very rapidly dis disappeared into small little fragments of polar ice. Here you can see the glistening trapped air bubbles. Um, next image, please. Next image, please, thank you. So we can make this smaller. So I began to think about this, this idea that um, there were equal and equivalent um, ways in which polar history are written. And I started to think about that history in a sort of solid manner. And of course, I started to think about the equivalence between ice and glass. Glass being a kind of solid method and also glass being the method by which throughout history, if you think of the microscope and um, telescopic lenses of Galileo. Um, scientific explorers have always been thinking about glass as a medium through which to understand the universe and our place within it um, throughout cultural time, really. But wh what I was trying to explore here were these little fragments, clusters of, 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 of for solid formations, in, in, in a sense. Um, and, and this is one of the early um, explorations of, of that um, in a, in a kind of poetic sense. Um, and um, it was a result of 
what, what we might call um, carving into, 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 into glass. Next image, please. Keep going. And so this idea that um, Arendt referenced about these sort of sea change treasures and this idea that history is perhaps crystallized into, into these formations. Um, I think one of the things that I was fascinated by was um, this kind of idea that these formations might, might in, in, induce a kind of sense of, of opacity and how we can look at history as being translucent perhaps. And, and both translucent and opaque um, and partially obscured. And that what we would have with the glass was a kind of clarity, um, a, a way of looking at this history, which, which might invite um, an imaginative um, view in, 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 into, into these ideas of, of matter and meaning. Next image, please. The following image. Okay, so um, one of the early exhibitions was called Solid, Liquid and Gas, which came directly after this initial exploratory work. Um, Solid and Liquid and Gas was a was an exhibition at the V&A Museum in the Majeski Courtyard. And one of the things that I was fascinated by um, was this idea that um, of, of the courtyard as being a, a, a form of, of, of contemporary form of, of an, an ancient Greek temple. If you think of um, Delphi, and if you think of the VNA has inscriptions on, on it, one of the inscriptions was know thyself. And this kind of idea that um, was derived from Delphi, Delphi was said to, to um, descend to her chamber where she were effectively um, inhaled the hydrocarbons and methanes and offered up predi ambiguous predictions of the future and began to think about that these sounds of these gases that I've been recording is, is telling us something uh, and, and offering secrets from the past really that would, would, would point us towards the future. So solid, liquid and gas had the solid element of glass fragments in the water. The, liquid state of water was was the elliptical pool itself and i also installed the sound of those recordings uh, at three points around uh, the courtyard itself which is semi-enclosed next image please next image Great. Um, next show I'd like to talk about is a work called Ice Floor, which was commissioned by Arup. And in collaboration with Arup and the British Antarctic Survey, we thought about the question of what does it mean to touch and be in touch with the earth? Um, one of the key characteristic elements we felt was that there was a, a huge gap, enormous gap between the sort of spatial conception of, of, the, of the Arctic and Antarctic um, and, and the kind of temporal conception of, of time and place. Um, central to that was the idea of temperature. Um, so we created uh, um, a heat controlled room, which um, was minus six, and we provided blankets for visitors to walk into a, 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 a small intimate space where we um, invited visitors to hold a slice of um, polar history in the palm of their hands. If you could just move on a little bit um, to the next image, Dejan, we can see that what we have here is a circular structure containing 240 um, fragments of polar ice which were drilled from two kilometers below, below the Antarctic surface by colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey and brought into intimate proximity in central London. And over the course of three months, two, two, over 2,000 visitors were able to gain a kind of proximity to this very distant and, and perhaps ambiguous question of what it means to touch and, and, and have a kind of perspective on something that was 
traditionally um, inaccessible. Next image, please. One of the things we didn't anticipate was that um, over the course of the exhibition, that um, the visitor's breath um, sublimed into the ice itself, becoming a key essential part of the work. Next slide, please, Dejan. The last show I'd like to talk about is um, um, it's an exhibition, uh, another collaborative exhibition with the British Antarctic Survey and Arab at COP26, where we were um, very fortunate to um, present work at a, a, a pivotal point um, um, in, in, in the present. Um, and and the, it was taking place at the Glasgow Science Centre. Next image, please. Um, much of the intellectual phrase of, of the exhibition was carried in this image, which was shot um, and here I am um, characteristically um, posing in front of a film which was shot um, from a helicopter um, in, 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 in Antarctica. And much of the, of the kind of emotional and intellectual um, sensibility of the, of the exhibition was carried in this um, film. Because um, one of the things that um, we wanted to do was to bring to intergovernmental political de uh, debate was a kind of sense of emotion because it seems that there is a kind of impasse or, or, or lack of emotion when we come to talk about our relation to the earth or particularly the Arctic or Antarctic, that there is it's a sort of frozen state and, and, and perhaps detached sense of, of, of what it means to kind of talk about these things. We, we, we very, um, you could say, talk about the climate promiscuously and, and we sometimes neglect or negate a kind of sense of value and what it means to kind of think about the value of these things beyond their economic impulse. Um, and so, and so one of the, what, what, what we're looking at is, is here is a kind of, we felt that perhaps if people could see that or have a sense of site specificity, that it might locate um, sort of international delegates that came to, 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 the, to the international summit. Next image, please. So what we thought we would look at, um, we presented three works. On the left, we had a work called 1765, and on the right was a work called Ice Core. Um, and so what we had was, on the left, a glass sculpture, which contained air from the year 1765, which was the agreed date for when we started to cause chaos or havoc on the planet. In fact, because we're in Glasgow and the inventor of the, steam engine or made advances towards the steam engine. James Watts was, was a native of Glasgow. We felt that perhaps if we um, located a precise volume of verifiable volume of air from the year 1765 and extracted it and somehow had a kind of time capsule and brought it to the Glasgow Science Centre, that questions of the climate and the atmosphere would be brought directly into uh, a, sort of, a, a sort of proximity which isn't easily affordable. And um, on the right, um, we would have the polar opposite of that, which, which would just have a, we wanted to have a low carbon footprint. So we just had a volume of ice, which was um, encased in um, an acrylic um, formation and descended from the, the ceiling. And just have these two forms there um, in the space, which would allow delegates and visitors to, to kind of take on these two forms and not have to explain what the correlation was, but just to have them there and perhaps um, invite a, a discourse or conversation of what it means to look at these states of matter. Next image, please. So over the course of uh, COP26, um, here you have a, um, the ice slowly ticking away, sl slowly re referencing time, but also referencing matter, but also giving a, bit, a, a kind of material sense of urgency. Next image, please. Here it is in a different altered state. Next image, please. The third piece was a work called Ice Stories. And what we felt was um, 
what was important to hear is to hear uh, the, the voice of climate scientists who, whose um, engagement with the polls um, is largely responsible for how that history is written. So on the left, um, what, we, what we have here is a work which um, we sent out invitations to leading climate scientists from around the world and asked us to tell, tell us you know, what their experience of over 50 years or so um, has told them. And so um, we had a variety of international voices, Italian, French, um, New Zealand, um, and, and, and created a, a, a kind of concrete poetry, really, and, and embedded that um, in, in a kind of permanent state um, in, in vinyl cut um, words, which are on the concrete floor of the gallery, and also made a film, which was an impermanent state. So that what you had was the voices of the climate scientists of, of, of the Arctic South um, and North central to those climate discussions at COP26. Next image, please. Next image, please. So here you have um, an image of the central part of the glass sculpture 1765, we can't see air. So we had to kind of imagine um, how, we, how we were going to approach that. And, and the one of the solutions we came up with was by casting a cylindrical glass form and leaving a void in that. Um, and filling that central void with liquid and then injecting that liquid with air so that you can have a discernible sense at eye level of that volume of air from 1765. So this image here is the, the volume of air from a key pivotal point in geological time, just before, at the very last possible date before we essentially transformed the planet. And the final image, I believe, Dejan, is um, an image of that work which appeared uh, in The Guardian. And um, in many ways, we felt that the room became um, a space of conversation, uh, of dwelling, of, of experiencing polar ice in three states, but also kind of opened up a, se a sense of proximity and, and intimacy and, and perhaps an intellectual and emotional um, engagement with some of these comp complex ideas. And, and that we perhaps felt that we were contributing in some way to a, a kind of um, poetic um, conception of, of how we can look at our relationship to um, the Arctic North and the Antarctic South. So I'm, I'm gonna stop here and I'm sure that Dejan's got some, some other things that he wants to talk about um, and I'm sure we can pick them up uh, in the conversation. Thanks very much, Wayne. This was absolutely stunning in terms of images. I'll let, I'll let the uh, audience process a little bit and please pose a question or a comment in Q&A uh, if you have any. Uh, but I will start and I'm not sure if uh, Johan will, will join us. He's in the depths, in the darkness. Um, in the middle of the night. Oh, there he is. Good. No, no, no. It's quite uh, enjoyable. I mean, you guys have no idea where we are. This, uh, it's really, it's something else. Yeah. <laughs> Ed, I bet it would be amazing, amazing to actually be there uh, in the outside. So I, I'll ask when you uh, first, just because the, the images are fresh and it strikes me uh, something really, really incredible and important that I absolutely love which is uh, this whole effort that you're doing seems to summon a very particular kind of intimacy. And the same thing with Johan. But what is really marvelous to me is that it's the intimacy with something that's radically distant, something that's so far away. First of all, geographically, uh, spatially. And secondly, it's even cold literally cold and yet there's a 
there's a, a quite physical uh, invocation and summoning of intimacy. So I just wanted to your thought to hear your thoughts about that kind of fascination with the distant and and summoning of intimacy uh, with that because a lot of art seems to me doesn't really go, uh, cross that gap. Uh, people form yeah. intimacy with something that's very close to them. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was fascinated by actually was was the kind of, you know, the kind of a, a project which would be grounded in scientific fact, but would have, um, you know, artistic, um, um, you know, space in which to kind of look at um, some of these complexities. And it, it, it occurred to us, um, occurred to me pretty early that one of the issues that we have is that we have these sort of um, divisions. You know, we have science here and we have art there. Um, and, and, and that um, actually, um, it's particularly at COP, what you realize is that the, the conversation uh, there was really about power and, and, and the kind of issue of, of who has it and who doesn't have it and who's willing to kind of, you know, look at these questions of the earth and the climate. And it seemed to be governed by um, um, economics, essentially. And what we felt was that actually, but if we if we collapse those distances um, um, with a kind of um, perhaps more poetic um, conception, that maybe that we could contribute something to these very very generic discourses where we have art over here, science over here, politics over here, ethics over here. And all of these, you know, all of these things are divided into things that don't actually connect. And often, some of the um, dullest work um, or, or science and art collaborations, um, um, so in, in my opinion, um, or um, I wouldn't say dull, but um, the reason why we find them difficult to, to because we're bombarded with data. We, we don't really need more data. Uh, you know, it's, this. You know what we're doing to the planet is ubiquitous. We can see it um, on our TV screens every day. Uh, we don't need a lack of data because we, 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 it's ubiquitous. Um, but what's, what, we, what we tend to think is that it's actually, even though it's ubiquitous, it's, it's still obscure what our relationship to the Earth is. So we um, felt that um, for these, these type of exhibitions, which it had to be grounded in science, but it also had to have the engineering skills to be so precise to, to be able to actually um, um, invite people into a kind of collaborative space of dwelling where people could freely find for themselves what these things meant to them. Um, we found that people were resilient or particularly re resistant to be told how to think about the climate. Um, we, they they, they re rejected more data, more statistics. And in fact, um, you know, we tried to go about, uh, you know, the usual curatorial text and catalogs and, and people actually, um, you know, um, you know, sort of the idea people didn't need to be told any more uh, about these things. What they wanted, what we felt that they wanted to be located within these things and offered a space of exploration. And so these, this kind of idea of fragments, perhaps being kind of moments of material and literary and, and material fragments was, was perhaps a method for, for perhaps inviting people to, to hold that history in the palm of their hands. And sometimes mm -hmm. they're right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, this is interesting what Wayne is saying there, but, you know, the, this question of um, people don't want more data. And I think what, one thing is, uh, it's an old, uh, age-old uh, kind of argument about art is that art is about meaning. We need to understand what is the meaning of things. You know, um, life without meaning is, is no life whatsoever, you know, and this is the thing that art is uniquely posited to do is to explain to people how we are meaningfully positioned in relation to things. And um, and I, I just want to talk a little bit about intimacy and all those things, you know, um, Okay, firstly, we in South Africa, we cannot talk about intimacy without talking about the intimacy of tyranny. I feel remember's great text on, on intimacy and the forms of power and how power exercises itself and attaches itself 
uh, intimately to each of us. Um, but I also think that there's, you know, in, in a presentation like the one that we were presenting tonight, you know, for, for me, being out here in the cradle of humankind in in one of the last um, uh, uh, unpolluted natural water sources, even in a space like the cradle of humankind, uh, walking around with my feet, feeling the water, caring about this space quite deeply because I've been working here now for nearly 20 years and so on. Um, if we don't feel this thing ourselves, if we don't care, if these things are not meaningfully connected to the core of our being, to stick with a, a, a metaphor that we have, you know, we can let almost anything pass. We will, we will accept almost anything. And so, so I'm always interested in, in being located at the struggle for meaning. What does all of this mean? How do we feel it? How does it make us feel? And how, how can we imaginatively help other people rethink the meanings that they have to existing um, issues, problems, uh, the world in general, and so on? And I think, uh, again, that's, that's something that Wayne and I've been discussing for many, many years, but it's certainly come heavily into focus the, the last while with our various collaborations. Um, Dejan, anything else from you or anybody in the audience? Yes, indeed. Thank you for that answer. And uh, uh, the, the, the struggle of wrestling with meaning that you're performing uh, uh, is palpable through the enormous effort that you're making and the enormous precision with which you're doing that grappling. So we have a question from Linda Kaper. Uh, she says, thank you, Wayne and Johan. Can you please say something about the reaction you receive from your audiences and what do you think about the impact your work makes on those audiences? So the importance of the impact, uh, I guess. Um, Wayne, you like to go first? Yeah, Yeah. I mean, to be honest, um, we were overwhelmed by the impact. Um, you have to remember that this show was during COVID and it, it was it wasn't clear and it wasn't we weren't certain that we'd actually be able to exhibit this work. First of all, it took over two years of planning. Um, the 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 UK were the were the host of this event, and it, if it wasn't for the um, skillful um, uh, negotiations on the part of um, colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey, um, we we I, um, it would have, would not have been able to be possible. Uh, and for colleagues at Arab, um, and, and this kind of lo the logistics of being able to actually bring work uh, and matter to Glasgow at a time of the pandemic was incredibly challenging. Um, the, the, the kind of framework for the climate summit was particularly um, focused on the political. And so you can imagine people coming to Glasgow really with an emphasis on the political. But one of the curious things is that we, we did have a num we had a wide range of responses. I, I mean, I particularly remember things like delegates would either walk in and walk straight out to the Indian delegates who'd walked in and decided that it was like a chill out room. And th this was the best thing that they could ever experience because it was <laughs> actually the room had a kind of sense of peaceful med meditation. So I, I, and I, I curiously remember a combination of um, the Indian delegates coming into the room and taking their shoes off and just, you know, relaxing and, and listening to the sounds of this carbon dioxide and the methane and really starting to imagine what that might mean. And, 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 and we had a wide range of, you know, from school kids right up to, you know, um, uh, more mature visitors across the demographic. Um, and we were really, we were delighted at the kind of wide and, and shocked at the wide range of people who actually expressed an interest in, in some of this, in, in some of this work, which is, which is um, quite obscure for, for many people. And um, we felt that um, if you look at, say, um, the work of Robert Smithson and how um, one of the great um, ways in which this challenging work is really um, made um, communicates itself is, is 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 through the media, and we had a wonderful contain, uh, a, a campaign run by uh, uh, Linda actually, Linda Kappa at the British Antarctic Survey, where we were able to kind of share this work in a very generous way, without telling people how to think, 
and, and inviting people into this kind of way of, of, of looking at this, uh, essentially what was matter uh, and, and what, what, what did matter. So, you know, it, it, was it, um, it wasn't insignificant that we were able to bring uh, um, this, this, this material from Antarctica directly into Glasgow. Um, and it wasn't without a, a lot of effort and a lot of sweat, blood and tears um, in the city that James Watts was born in. And, and we, we kind of rather felt that we went beyond the kind of political remit to kind of get people to rethink of, of what does that mean um, mm. uh, to, to, to look at the, the, the history in this way. So I think that the impact was overwhelming both online and offline. Um, there were some crazy mm. statistics um, where um, we um, communicated um, uh, some of the research in, on, um, in, in online forums. We had a um, public debate in um, the Arab offices in Sydney. So at one point, the exhibition was in the southern and northern hemisphere at the same point. It was widely co um, co covered in the media um, beyond the kind of traditional um, art, art and science uh, realms. And, and, we, and it kind of exceeded um, what we felt it would have um, connected with. So um, in some senses, it kind of went beyond the kind of political domain and into a kind of more cultural domain, um, which was, which was uh, mm -hmm. a kind of, uh, in, in many ways, um, a good thing to see. Look, I'll answer shortly. For me, it's very simple. I mean, I'm... I understand that there's a world of impact and that there's broader kind of ways in which art is situated and in which, I mean, especially in academia, we think about, oh, the impact of your publications, uh, how many people saw it, how many citations are there, this technical, call it the, the world of, uh, the technocratic world of impact. And I'm very resistant to that. I'm not interested in that technocratic world of impact and everything else. I think that there's a place for it, of course, um, but for me personally, I mean, I, I, audiences, um, I, I, I like having children as audiences. They're great audiences um, because they they still look at the world with a, with a sense of possibility and so on. Um, more complicated audiences and so on. You know, I always just think to myself, if you can change the mind of one person, then you, you have really, really accomplished much. Because to really fundamentally intervene on the level between the imagination, the subconscious, and the kind of material experience of the day by day of any individual, I think is, is a, a fantastic achievement. So if you can manage to do that with one artwork and someone comes to you years later and they say to you, look, this thing still lives with me. This image has lodged itself my subconscious and it travels with me into the future. It doesn't really matter to me if there's 100 or just one person or 10,000 people. I think the fact of the matter is that's important. In fact, I would actually say if there's 10,000 people, then um, I, I might be worried simply um, because people, <laughs> because because there's a sense of responsibility with that. So um, for me, generally, I think um, that's where I want to intervene. I want people to remember images, ideas, combinations of them, and um, for that to actually affect a real kind of change on a very, very deep level, I mean, um, I agree with, where I mean, it I, stays with someone young. You know? I, I kind of totally in agreement with Johan here. I mean, very often the kind of the impulse of, say, land art or art pobre, particularly land art, um, is, the, is the kind of resistance to the kind of uh, commodification of, of kind of, of, of the object. And, and the kind of work that we, we're kind of interested in is not looking at um, you, know, uh, you know, artistic production as a kind of form of commodification. And, and in some ways, um, what we're tapping into is a kind of resistance to those kind of modes of kind of discourse, really. And particularly if you're talking about something that's always disappearing or always transforming in its liquid, solid and vaporous state. And these kind of things um, re uh, reject the kind of commodification of, of capital. In, in many ways, so I, I kind of I, I agree with what Johan's saying here. Is that the kind of the kind of aim is not necessarily to kind of think about these things in 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 the in the kind of terms that are usually kind of looked at when we talk about the art or the, the object and and what that might um, how that might manifest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, it's wonderful if there's a 
great reception to the work, but I, I would think there's an untimely element that's valuable, maybe the most valuable to the work as well, which speaks to different times in different eras, both past and future. So mm -hmm. it, it, I agree with both of you and what Johan was saying in calculations and numbers, uh, the untimely element is not concerned with, with, the, with the numbers and calculations. Um, there are two comments I would like to read just as an affirmation and confirmation. One is from uh, Zianda Mekosana. I just wanted to say I love the use of touch to bring these big concepts and issues closer to home. I think this relates to that intimacy I was, I was also referring to that you both evoked. And then from Nandita Shet, uh, a comment more than a question. Thank you for connecting the poetics of, of Shakespeare's sea change to ice. The connection between movement, tempest, and the frozen, still yeah. unmoving ice is favorably chilling me. Um, <laughs> so all those references kind of connected. Uh, I wanted to ask you, and then this is also in in wait for uh, Howard Cagle, if he's able to join us. It seems he might not be. There's a there's something going on in south south of England. Um, he was going to present on Robert Smithson, and we'll try to uh, mm -hmm. reschedule for uh, in two weeks. So all of these kind of things kind of connect uh, 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 to each other. The question of the method, which you use the term, uh, a word several times, both of you use it, drilling, and it in, in relationship to Hannah Arendt and Benjamin, I just wanted to hear more about that, the the act of drilling. It seems a violent act. It, it Obviously, it's also what land artists have done and used. They drilled in order to sculpt their, their uh, sculptures uh, from earth and soil. Um, but what is your relationship to drilling as a method, I guess, for your work? Okay, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can I can jump in here, Johan, if you want. But I mean, for me, yeah, just go ahead. Mind me, go ahead. Um, yeah. for, me, for me, it's both a kind of factual thing. Uh, my colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey factually drill below the surface. They use um, 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 the combined efforts of, of from looking above, below, and across the surface of the Earth um, to literally drill below um, the surface of Antarctica, because um, you know, we have um, we have coral, we have tree rings, we have stalactites, we have um, pollen, we have various proxies. But actually, the most accurate um, information that we have about the climate is is only obtainable by drilling into to below the earth, where this information is preserved. So, on, on, in, in a kind of literal sense, um, that's there is that, there is that form of drilling. But then there's also the kind of metaphorical sense of the kind of poetics of of going into kind of what's essential and what's at the center of this discourse. You know, what are we talking about? What would we, how, you know, how can we kind of rethink that discussion rather than looking um, at the kind of economic or political kind of domain of, of the climate? And in fact, actually look at maybe the climate and atmosphere, because that's the key thing. One of the things I didn't realize is that we can't just talk about the climate in absence of the atmosphere because the gases surrounding the planet and, and the kind of climate literally is, is a kind of term to discuss general weather patterns. But you can't really look at these things from a, well, I certainly wasn't interested in looking at them from a kind of oblique sense. I wanted to be quite concrete about these things. And the only way to do that um, is to look at literally um, find um, the most accurate source of that. And that's these um, ice cores which are cylinders of ice, which are extracted from below the surface of the earth. So I, I don't know if that's mm. answering the question of the question. I, I, I found it very interesting when Wayne started speaking about questions of drilling and it was connected to a literary uh, method, you know, in relation to 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 um, uh, studying, you know, uh, thinking how, how it is that we access layers of depth and so on, you know, so... So there was kind of, I, I mean, in that sense, I, I guess I'm an old <laughs> humanity scholar after all. But I, I like the kind of 
human level to it because it also kind of made sense to me as someone who's a sculptor and who's worked often with materials that require that level of handling. And then um, there is an unpeeling, let's say, that occurs as you drill into a thing. It is not simply a technical process of, of drilling a hole and attaching it to another. It is, is within that process of opening up a negative space. Suddenly there's a visibility of, a, of, a, of an interior that you may not even have been aware of uh, in the beginning. So, so for me, there's something really um, tangible about that process, and material about it, which um, I guess, you know, many years ago when I was, I was very involved in, let's say, doing a, a PhD or any of those kind of things, I, I felt that there was a kind of a, uh, a cerebral nature to the, the, the acquiring of knowledge that I was missing. And so when I find concrete material metaphors like this, that kind of, um, and I'm sticking to Bachelard because that is my person for the night. But anyway, when I find these kind of imaginative ways of rethinking scholarship and creative thinking and so on, it says, look, you can go beyond the skin of the thing and land up layers and layers deeper. Um, you know, that for me is an interesting way of, of thinking about not only criticality, but also, uh, creativity itself, you know. I fear we may have lost Excellent. Aishan. Yes, I, I hear you. It, Excellent um, answer. There is additional comment and, and, a, and a, a question that I think connects precisely to this uh, 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 action of drilling as a method in a way. Uh, here, I'll read it and you tell me what you think. It, it, it has to do with formal, formally <coughs> constructed pieces of art. What would you both think around formal stagnation to ways we can think formally in creating art about climate change? And next question, thinking to new formal structures to engage a, that debate with new aesthetic possibilities. So I guess how do how do we formally engage aesthetics of climate? I, I, which I want is to what you to both have performed yeah. today. It's just yeah. how do you how do you actually think about that when you're producing your work? So so I want to I want to turn to something interesting I found while I was uh, kind of reading Bachelard and making my own notes and so. You know, in, in, in some sense, uh, of course, we are all products of our time and so on. And Bachelard was very connected to formal questions of poetry and the depth of metaphors and how these metaphors lacking certain depths were described uh, in formal terms and so on. You know, but I think we've moved. Um, well, I certainly throughout my own kind of development as an artist, I, I, I think formal things are important because they are the ways in which we access things. But I think um, slowly but surely what became more interesting for me was what you might broadly term a material approach. So it is that finding of beauty, not in a formal sense uh, or poetry, if you like, within the materiality of the thing itself. And, and there's a decided kind of performative, sensuous element to that. So for me, ways of connecting with these things, and the previous speaker also mentioned that it's, it's corporeal, the body, the senses, um, Thinking outside the the, the kind of uh, narrow aesthetics of viewers or of of uh, uh, of vision alone, um, I I think that's incredibly important. You know, we we need to engage the rest of the senses as part of our our tools um, to communicate sensibly to people, and we need to really have a corporeal investment from the viewer in the work that we're producing, because. When people feel a thing in their body, even as if it is only by way of imaginative um, uh, identification with something they see elsewhere, it is it generates an empathetic response, and that empathetic response is absolutely key to getting people to care about stuff. At least for me, you know, there are different ways of doing it, but certainly that for me is one of the kind of strengths of thinking performatively and materially and less form uh, formally, um, mm. if you like, you know, yeah. Wayne? I, mean, I, I would kind of, you know, I would say that actually um, the kind of question implies division again, and I, I'm rejecting that idea. I mean, I kind of like the idea of form and formlessness. 
And, you know, there should not be any division between the intellect and the senses in that regard. So I'd be mm. more keen to kind of look at how these things, you know, are balanced. Because because uh, one of the things is, is that I think everyone is aware of these kind of questions, but, you know, these things are incredibly imbalanced. Um, and we've, uh, uh, I think that we, we, um, we tend to, you know, kind yeah, of have a kind of, friend. you know, we kind of tend to somehow divide these questions about whether things are um, formal or informal or, or kind of, you know, hot, hot or, or cold, you know, but what about if, if it can be a kind of combination of both, the things perhaps more interested of what happens in between matter? And so, uh, in fact, I'm, I, I want to reject that kind of idea that we have to think of one or the other and perhaps think about form and formlessness. Yes, but you still had to figure out a way to represent that uh, well, air. This is what I'm saying. And you did. Well, uh -huh. I'm thinking, but what I'm trying to suggest is that the kind of form and formless, formlessness itself is, is kind of within. It's not imposed on without. And I think mm. that mm. I always worry mm. about art that tries to tell you how to think. I've, no one goes to an art gallery to be told how to, 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 to think. Mm -hmm. You want mm -hmm. to be able to feel or maybe kind of think about or perhaps kind of, you know, but I, I think when you start telling people how to think, it becomes a polemic and, and people reject that. I've seen that in my own exhibition. So letting, it, it's kind of what Johan was saying too, letting the form emerge from the matter itself. Yeah. But the, this this requires extreme attunement to the matter. Well, this is where, I mean, this is what the power of, it won't we'll say the power, but art has the ability to do that. I mean, it has the ability to operate yeah. in these spaces that that perhaps some of the other disciplines can't cannot. Um, and so I think it's the skill or the kind of recklessness of the artist to try and find this kind of language. Um, and, it, and it might not necessarily be the most obvious. Uh, often it isn't. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed. Thank you. There is a question uh, from Bruce Glavovich. I would like to invite him. I think he has access to the video as a panelist, too. And uh, he's trained as a scientist. And he gave a talk uh, last uh, Friday, and he's he loved your presentation, and he put a question in the chat. But Bruce, if you can if you can uh, share your video, please uh, uh, come join us. There you go. And Bruce is uh, in New Zealand, so now we have London, South Africa, New Zealand, and New Mexico. Okay. What were you saying, Bruce? I I, I didn't get that. Sorry, I didn't get the full. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm unable to access the Q and A um, block, so I, I dropped a, a comment in the in the chat against the rules. But um, yeah, I'm found your presentation is really stimulating, and you know, as you can tell from my accent, I come from uh, that uh, cradle of humanity too. Um, originally, I guess the. As someone who's been trained in the traditional environmental sciences, but works in the critical social sciences, the whole focus on aesthetics, consciousness, those deeper layers of understanding and perspective and the provocation that you brought to COP in Glasgow, I find incredibly stimulating and, and, and wonderful and challenging. I wonder what your thoughts are about go art and its place going beyond deepening understandings and consciousness to to action i'm thinking extinction rebellion protest many climate scientists that i work with are increasingly finding their reality disrupted by the predicaments that we face and and rethinking their roles and so i just wondered you know as part of essentially what i this is a kind of a rage against the power and economics that pervaded COP in your experience, beyond trying to uh, provoke a deeper level of consciousness, you know, taking that into direct action, protest, the things that we're seeing around the world from young people, from from scientists and others. I wonder if you have anything to to kind of comment on on moving from consciousness to direct action. 
Well, I mean, it, it depends how you define action. Um, or are you talking about inaction? Because for me, COP was, a, you know, a, a clear example where perhaps inaction was the kind of much more uh, felt kind of consequence of, of, of decades of not looking at something that's been evident for many, many, many years. Um, and, and it seems to me that everyone knows what to do. And, it, and it's, I don't believe that an, a, the artist should be, you know, um, solely um, conditioned to have to kind of speak for the world. One can only speak for oneself in that regard. And actually, we, we felt with that, uh, um, that, 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 that maybe um, what was clear was that, that, that what, what governs, um, what, what moderates, it, it, uh, if you think of um, the kind of history of the, of the earth is being moderated by solid, liquid and vaporous matter, there is a kind of equal and equivalent condition within politics which is vaporous and, and, and liquefied and, and kind of not solid and is not stable. So there isn't, you know, so these states of matter aren't just metaphorical. They, they, they actually feel that that was quite resonant. And perhaps an artist can kind of offer a, a critique in the form of resistance, which is subtle, which isn't, um, doesn't need to shout, but could be no less more, it could be actually equally powerful and, and, and have resonant charge and, and subtlety. Um, and I feel that actually um, we were able to do that um, in, in a way that was, um, was had its own um, integrity. Oh, just unmute yourself, Johan, please. Uh, uh, Bruce, I see the phrase direct action there. I'm always a sucker for that phrase. So, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, I, yes, I look, I, Here's the things. On one hand, I think one is incredibly right, and so um, artists cannot represent everyone, and so on. And, and I think nor can scientists really. You know, we, we respect a lot of uh, individuals, and so. On. But I think at the same time, you know, having grown up in South Africa and having witnessed the kind of deeply uh, um, uh, problematic uh, impact of politics and and so forth, you know, my own feeling as an artist so far has been is that you are involved in. Um, in struggle in one way or another and you have to be willing to um commit to it um you know so i've always had one foot in the door with politics in, in quite a straightforward sense now um you know certainly one aspect of my own work is being heavily committed in in, in relation to community engagement projects with young artists where they actively engage with larger communities and um, try and help them to reconsider their own accepted assumptions and um, actually affect real change. But I mean, I am not above going uh, uh, to protest. I s supported the students with their protest. I wandered with them and protested along them and so Because I think that you have to let your voice count when it counts, uh, when it matters, you know. Um, and I think that we're going to see growing frustration not only with the planet. I shudder when I think of my own kids uh, or my own boy now in this case and what it is that we will leave him to in here. I want them to be angry about this. They have to hold us accountable. They have to hold politicians accountable. That's probably the most important thing. Um, and then personally speaking, I mean, I love making political work. Um, I don't think that when you make political work, you... You... Um, you let go of the, the the power of aesthetics and thinking about art forms and those kind of things because they are uh, things that we uniquely have that a lot of people don't have i well, always I, say i love science but you know they don't have our images <laughs> and so i think yeah, there's a good way that we can connect yes i get what you're saying Jan, but i mean I, I i'm you know i i'm taking the assumption that art is not divorced from politics in many ways all all forms of art political it's not what i'm saying is is that i mean my most uh, one of the most striking things i remember about cop is meeting the brazilian representative for the indigenous peoples and what was really powerful about what she was doing i mean there were many kind of you know delegates talking about things i think what was really powerful was hearing about her lived experience there were many people talking about the ethics and the kind of supposed intellectual aspect mm. of these things, but actually meeting someone from the, 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 the um, indigenous um, 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 region of Brazil and hearing about the kind of extent to which prospectors of 
um, eradicated the kind of uh, uh, lo locality in which she's her life, their lives depend on. You kind of that thing, that moment when 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 you, you kind of realize that actually um, th that is more perhaps more directly important to me than the kind of rhetoric of kind of a noise and amplified glare of of anything that that it was offered up by any politician. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, just coming back again to that, that is, I think what art is is often uniquely good at. It is telling those stories. It is making people understand and empathize for them in real, immediate, felt, uh, uh, bodily ways, you know, to, to be able to listen to that. But I also do think that there's a lot of art in this world that is, is that, that pays lip service to to politics and so forth. And I think that that is a different thing. You know, I, I, we can go to very nice galleries and see highly political work, but most of it is really just paying lip service to to the dominant kind of, uh, uh, and, and coming but back to another point, the dominant kind of formal and, and conceptual issues of the day. But to actually kind of be committed to those things beyond that moment, I think, you know, that is an interesting shift. That is, uh, you know, that's the difference between the scientists also sitting within their office and writing up what they're doing and actually getting involved, you know, and, and, and to, to be frank, I mean, those are the kinds of scientists I like, generally, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think uh, those are the kinds of artists that I like as well. Yeah. Thank you. I just, uh, that is, is helpful. And, uh, you know, the conversation we could continue for an extended period of time, but mm. I think, just to clarify, Wayne, my it is precisely that lack of action by the politician that ought to provoke rage amongst us as citizens, as artists, as scientists, as philosophers, as human beings. And I think art brings a distinct way of engaging in mm. that response to the lack of action, or at least the self-serving action mm. or inaction that is taken by a political and economic elite. Mm. Well, well, Bruce, I can tell you, you know, I, we're sitting, there's a very specific reason why we're sitting in the cradle of humankind, because the water here is, is so polluted at present that, the, that, that uh, uh, um, you know, we're at the Nyrex Foundation and we're here with the curators friend, uh, and, and, um, and, and we've been working on water kind of issues here because the water here is now so polluted that it actually threatens the, the world heritage site of the space. And the fact that people are not absolutely enraged about this is and you know it's a maddening kind of problem and so on. so um being here for me is is in a way it is directly drawing attention to to that it's saying it's really wonderful that we're in this pretty stream but do you understand that this is one of the last remaining ones in this space in the very space that we as humans originate from this is the last fresh water we have remaining unless we take drastic action, unless we do something about it. So, so I, I, I get it. And, and quite frankly, I'm absolutely amazed at the fact that people are not more um, politically active and, and not more directly active about these issues in their lives. It, it's and, astounding for me, really. And, and also, I mean, I just wanted to say, Bruce, it's it, part of the kind of, um, kind of, Quality, formal qualities of the work retains that violence. If you think of the glass sculpture mm. that I've been working with, I, mm. I was, look, I was sort of, um, you know, explicitly trying to show that violence, uh, uh, that volatility, uh, that kind of shearing off of kind of ice, you know, formations, and or, or whether it's glass or ice, or, or kind of the kind of um, upper or lower limits of kind of audibility and visibility. Um, the work has that in its inherent kind of um, center. And so in many ways, that's my form of resistance of trying to find a language or our form of resistance to trying to find a way of, of dealing with that um, in, a, mm. in such a way that kind of, um, you know, um, talks about something that's felt and heard and, and is really felt and, and really heard and, and, and really kind of um, is, is, is something um, partially obscure and so uh, I, I guess that violence that you were kind of talking about or action or inaction in many political senses is is, is a kind of part of the formal making and thinking i have to interrupt thank you so much johan and and wayne and bruce uh, this is an amazing discussion obviously uh we're over time it's we're, this is becoming durational performance 
uh, which personally <laughs> I'm okay yes. with. Uh, so yeah. who survives, survives in the end. Uh, but we have uh, still Professor Cagle to present on uh, Robert Smithson, uh, which will connect on these issues, I'm sure. And thank you so much for your patience, Howard. Problem. It's been. Uh, thank you very much, Dajan, everyone. It's been uh, such a treat listening to uh, to everybody, you know, to uh, Ilina, Johan, and Wayne, especially listening to you, Wayne. Uh, I'm going to be talking about your work at a seminar on planetary aesthetics next week, so uh, in London. So it's been kind of wonderful to uh, kind of hear your thoughts. Um, I'm going to talk, um, kind, of, kind of to address the, uh, you know, some of the themes of the the blazing world um, uh, proposal uh, tonight, and I want to, you know, s you know begin by saying I, I kind of broadly, but not uncritically, endorse the call for a new climatological imperative, and, and, and I'll sort of explain why. And I'm a little bit critical about it, but especially as a way of moving us from inaction to imagination in what Bruce very nicely described as these perilous times uh, last week, uh, times in which the contract between science and society, um, more broadly knowledge and action has been broken. And we've just been um, you know, debating precisely that, uh, that that brokenness, I think, and what, what art can uh, contribute to it. And I share the overall perplexity of, of uh, kind of Bruce, Alina, um, uh, Wayne and, and Johanna about the about how to understand and you know, how to how to work with the institutional institutional and cultural inertia in the face of an increasingly apparent dangerous kind of future of a climate emergency and this is a phrasing you know, used by my friends in Extinction Rebellion which I kind of prefer to the more anodyne climate change but I'll use climate change sometimes during what's coming. But I'd like to address kind of specifically the, the really fascinating question in the brief, which was what underlying symptoms do we carry that allow such recklessness? So how, you know, how can we be so reckless about the future, not even our futures, but the futures of others? And I want to look for these symptoms in the effects of an accelerated and still incompletely worked through transformation in the human consciousness of the future one in which the prevailing assumption that the future is a site for progress is undergoing rapid dissolution, um, confronted with a geologically informed understanding of climate emergency that is emerging and developing with a de degree of rapidity, extent and depth that I think is really quite impressive, whatever we may think about the inertia that seems to accompany it. Yet such rapid changes in fundamental orientations towards the future, of which there are a number of historical precedents, um, I believe, um, kind of offer, I think, uh, some sense of understanding the, the trauma and the shock that accompanies these, um, uh, you know, these changes, and that I think may contribute to the question of our reckless inaction and inertia that it's a response to a, a shock of a change in, in consciousness of what the future could be. And it could be that the reimagination of cultural and institutional anesthesia and inertia will be served, you know, not so much by imperatives, but by reconciling our, our knowledge with new cultural and aesthetic visions of the future, such as we've been uh, just been uh, you know, uh, debating. And for this, I, I, I just like to remind us all that we maybe shouldn't underestimate just how very recent the idea of a future of climate emergency is. I mean, I was innocent of it in uh, my childhood in a way that would be inconceivable for today's children. Along with the rest of my generation and those many of those that followed, you know, I was forced to learn an orientation towards a future of climate emergency. And I was forced with a rapidity urgency and even a growing sense of panic that could not help but bring with it distortion, shock and anesthesia, even inertia. You know, the shock is so great that how is it possible to uh, kind of respond with kind of coherent and um, effective action? It certainly would be a historical singularity if that were to occur and precisely that singularity is what we need. I mean, the very thought of humanity as a geologically effective force, you know, is with very few exceptions, 
the Stopanti in the 19th century is always cited as a, um, you know, an outlying precedent. Um, but it's almost, with, with very few exceptions, a 21st century phenomenon um, codified in Paul Crutzen's announcement of the Anthropocene. And it'd be interesting to uh, kind of take up that theme again. I'll, I'll, I'll approach it from a different angle a little later on. Um, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that the Anthropocene has not been accepted as a geological strata. We, we are then looking at a change in consciousness that is taking place at a scale that previously would have required decades, if not centuries, of patient reflection and debate to work through. And one such as the invention of the idea of freedom or the invention idea of the subject, um, which has taken time for us to understand and to live with. But unfortunately, we do not have the decades and centuries available to us for such debate. It's interesting that the historians of the scientific discovery of climate change agree that this science is also very recent. Spencer R. Weirton is now classic, the discovery of global warming. So it's from 2003 and re revised in 2008. And it's testimony to the pace at which this you know, um, kind of thinking develops and that this looks like a classic, um, uh, even, even slightly ancient text. Um, this discusses scattered contributions to the understanding of the human impact on climate emerging from meteorology, climatology, geology, and astronomy. But it also shows that a concerted and synoptic view of it all together, a global climate change, had to wait for the 1971 Stockholm Conference on the study of man's impact on climate. Paul N. Edwards' history of meteorology and climatology, you know, a vast machine, computer models, climate data, and the politics of global warming from 2010, also insists that notions of climate change are scientifically very recent and culturally even more kind of recent, emergent even. For Edwards, the move from, or rather inversion of, Julius von Hahn's 1883 definition of climate as, I quote, I quote Hahn, the sum total of the meteorological conditions insofar as they affect animal or vegetal life. The inversion of that to looking at the contribution of animal and veg vegetable lives affecting the sum total of meteorological conditions took almost a century. And while Edwards' account narrates quantitative improvement in data collection and modeling, he does give a catalytic role to the baleful interest in climate modeling by Manhattan Project veterans, Edward Teller and John von Neumann, for the purposes of ostensibly weather control, but also in casting anthropogenic climate change as a weapon in what was known as the strategy of environmental warfare that was subsequently outlined outlawed in the 1960s by a UN treaty. So anthropogenic climate change first appears as a focus concept in the context of changing climate, in the context of warfare, as, a, as, an, act of, as an act of war. Um, it's a, you know, it, it first appears as environmental warfare's interest in weaponizing the possibility of anthropogenic climate change. And Edward agrees with Weir that progress in understanding anthropogenic climate change can really begins in the, 19, in the 1970s. And with this military um, uh, link, you know, continuing into the 1970s. The study of climate change then, you know, before uh, this, before the 1970s, was curiously confined to the study of the geological record. That is, what was interesting was not so much the climate change that's awaiting us in 20 or 30 years, but the climate change of 60 million years ago, or 560 million years ago, or 250 million years ago. And Edwards puts this very neatly when he, when he writes, until the 1950s, in fact, scientific discussions of global climate change focus more on paleoclimate, climates of the geological past, than on historical time. Yet there is a telling lacuna in the historical narratives of Weird and Edwards when it comes to describing how the retrospective projections of these paleoclimatic discussions of global climate change came to be projected upon the present 
and the immediate future, as well as the contribution of anthropogenic forcing to contemporary and immediate future global climate change. And in some in some previous work, I've 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 laid great stress on the contribution of military strategic research and discussion to making this transition, drawing on the work of Jacob Darwin Hamlin and uh, O'Neill in their histories of the Cold War. Above all, both in terms of environmental warfare, but also in research into the predicted climatological effects of the nuclear war, of a nuclear war. And this became one of the main focuses of interest during the 1970s and early 1980s. And it's usually forgotten, or has been forgotten, that the inventor and theorist of the Anthropocene concept, the climatologist Paul Crutzen, in his earlier years, contributed to founding the field of strategic climatology in the early 1980s with a with a, with a extraordinary article uh, called "The Atmosphere After a Nuclear War: Twilight at Noon." And apropos of Alina's nitrogen anthropocene that we heard about later uh, earlier in the evening, Crutzen also wrote on the influence of nitrogen oxides on atmospheric ozone content, and indeed. In his article on the atmosphere after a nuclear war, one of his main points of argument is to show how the nitrogen released in what was being theorized as a possible limited nuclear war in the 70s and uh, 80s, um, that th the nitrogen released by those explosions would suffice to compromise you know, fatally the global ozone layer. Later, he would show, and for this was justly celebrated, that the same effect that is the effect that could be achieved by detonating nuclear weapons, the same effect could be accomplished by civilian, by civilian chlorofluorocarbons, um, both you know, uh, destroying the, the ozone layer. Both are examples then of anthropogenic climate change. The one is part of a deliberate military strategy, the other as an inadvertent effect of domestic and industrial refrigeration. And part of Crutzen, I mean, Crutzen wasn't, he wasn't defending um, limited nuclear warfare. He was trying to argue that, you know, actually an, inver an inadvertent uh, effect might be the destruction of the, uh, the ozone layer, as well as the destruction of agriculture by um, the, um, by the blotting out of the sun for extended periods of the time. I'm, I'm wondering now, though, whether this military genealogy of the thought and practice of anthropogenic climate change might not contribute to those underlying symptoms of climate recklessness mentioned in the, the Blazing World Brief for our, you know, our, our discussions. But, and, and I, I think it may do. I mean, there's, uh, there seems to be something interesting about the fact that the, you know, the, the idea of um, anthropogenic climate change originates as a weapon um, and then becomes a, uh, a predicament. Um, but I wanted today to try to look at another, perhaps this melancholy imaginary of the transition from paleo to current and future climate change. And for this, for this I find the mid 1960s work of Robert Smithson, you know, Wayne mentioned earlier as well, especially suggestive in providing a, an aesthetic reimagination of the transformation of geological into contemporary and future global climate change. I mean, Smithson's iconic spiral jetty has become an environmentalist bellwether now, beginning as a jetty, then being submerged for decades, and now completely landbound according to the movements of the water level of the Great Lake. But what particularly fascinates me about his work in, in 1966 is what has often been regarded as his idiosyncratic combination and kind of faulted as his idiosyncratic combination of interest in geology, cultural politics, and science fiction at this time. But looking back at it now, we can see that this actually provides a suggestive aesthetic matrix for combining geology, and yes, the geology of mankind, to use Crutzen's later phrase, with the present and the future. Precisely the combination necessary for translating paleo into contemporary and future understandings of 
climate change. Perhaps Smithson's, Smithson's work at this point in the mid 1960s is seismographically detecting these cultural and scientific fault lines and reorganizing them on an aesthetic plane. And in support of this hypothesis, I'd like to look at uh, Robert Smithson's uh, complete proposal for a monument to Antarctica. Um, and I'm going to try and share the screen. Dan, and if it goes wrong, uh, if you could uh, if you could find the uh, the positive and negative images of project for a uh, a, a monument proposal for a monument to Antarctica, but I'll try and share the screen now and see if it works. So, can you see a scene of the Antarctic Peninsula uh, now? Yes, actually. Good. It works. <laughs> I'm surprised. I was, I, I'm frantically looking for them, but we actually see them very well. Okay, that's uh, that's splendid. Well, yeah. yeah. There were some blokes digging up the road today, putting in uh, um, you know, op fiber optic cables, and I think they must have left the job for the weekend. So, uh, but I'm glad. I'm glad we've got. Uh, you know, we've we've got this. I mean, this is. Um, you know, th this is uh, kind of part of a uh this is part of a uh this is part of a uh a, a larger let's see if i can get this uh Interaction. And then, yeah, th this is part of a uh, you know, a larger work which was rediscovered in uh, 2001, and this is the part that was rediscovered in 2001. And I'll just see if I can uh, also find the uh, share the other part with you. has has the image changed uh good okay so we're uh we're yeah we're there so yeah, this, this was the work as it was originally as it was as it was known during the 1960s and kind of entered the over of uh of smithson um and it wasn't it, it wasn't it didn't go under smithson's title um it went under the title untitled um sf um landscape and What's important about the the discovery of the you know the, the whole work is that it juxtaposes positive and negative photostats of a scene of maritime labor in Antarctica. And quite often um, editors try to correct um you know Smithson's uh, kind of spelling. You know, it's assumed they didn't know how to spell Antarctica. But I think the emphasis on art in the middle is kind of quite uh, is quite deliberate. Um the simple reversal of the the image. Uh, so, if we take this as our positive image, the simple reversal of the uh, of the positive exposure reveals a negative Antarctica without snow, and placed together, we're given a flickering glimpse of a climate future in which the polar snow covering has disappeared. So it's possible to show in this work that from the you know from the uh, the ice cover of this image, uh, there is a future of the image without ice cover. And what this points to, I think, is you know, is, is Smithson working through a very complicated intersection between monumentality. So this is a monument to an Arctica um, landscape and to climate change or emergency. And of course, when these two images are put together you know, and, and shown together, um, they work, you know, the, the movement between them works both ways. You know, the negative is a future image of the positive, but the positive is also a memory of 
the negative. And this was something that Smithson was deeply preoccupied with um, between 1966 and 1967. There's a very, uh, there's a very beautiful fragment that um, um, that he didn't publish in his lifetime, but one that that was called "The Shape of the Future and Memory." And in this, he makes the uh, you know the wonderful proposition: memories have a way of trapping one's notion of the future and placing it in a brittle series of mental prisons. And in, in 1966, Smithson could also write that the that this, this, this image is one that is raising not only problems about the future, but also problems about the the the, the reason, the, the reason or the, the way in which we try to understand this uh, this future. And this was part of a kind of proposition which he developed most interestingly, I think, in 1968 in a, um, a text called a, a Sedimentation of the Mind, Earth Projects. And this is one in which he tried to make a direct um, linkage. I think this is universal. I don't think it's an analogy, but a direct linkage between geology and thinking, between the geo of Earth and the, you know, the thinking of logi or logos. You know, just a couple of sentences from this to show kind of how far he would go. One's mind and the earth are in a constant state of erosion. Mental rivers wear away abstract banks. Brain waves undermine cliffs of thought. Ideas decompose into stones of unknowing, and conceptual crystallizations break apart into deposits of gritty reason. And at the end, he'll say, a rubble of logic confronts the viewer as he looks into the levels of the sedimentation. The abstract grids containing the raw matter are observed as something incomplete, broken, and shattered. So looking at the monument to Antarctica, we see, first of all, a um, an iced uh, shoreline with seven kind of human figures kind of pulling a rope attached to uh, an, an icebreaker, scene of manual labor um, in a kind of high industrial, highly industrialized kind of setting, already quite anomalous uh, in many ways. Um, and with two groups of Spec of five of uh, of four and five spectators, um, kind of clustered um, above them in the uh, in 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 the plane, and um, two lone individuals towards the the bottom of the ice, kind of looking at the uh, what or watching the icebreaker, watching the ship, the icebreaker in the foreground. Two other ships are moored kind of further up. Now. In a sense, we you know, we have to ask the question: Well, what is the monument to Antarctica? Um, and the "an" there is working as a privation of art, you know. So saying, you know, it's it's a uh, not Antarctica. Um, what is the monument that uh, that that is here? One way I like to look at it, or the monument, is that the monument is the flicker between the the memory and the premonition, you know, the past and the future. The present and the the future. It's a kind of Heideggerian Augenblick, or a Benjaminian Fexia built. That is, it, it you know, its its senses is flickering, um, and this becomes the the monumental. It's the moment when the ice disappears, and our image is viewed as if after the climate emergency. And this is literally an apocalyptic image, an uncanny apocalyptic image, because what what Smithson is doing is making everything change while leaving everything the same. So it is the same uh, scene of the, Ar of the Antarctic Peninsula, but it strangely changes and in a very kind of powerful and uh, a destructive way. And this, this flickering, I think, then draws our attention to something that doesn't flicker uh, you know, between the, uh, the two. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the positive and the negative. And this is the architectural structure to, towards the upper left of the, uh, of the image that is set in a different light 
So there's something apocalyptic about this too. It's coming from somewhere else. Um, if you note the direction of shadow of the men, we can see that it's cast by a sun that is behind them to the right. If we look at the shadow, direction of shadow of the, the architectural form, we'll see that it is being lit from another direction by apparently a different sun. It's elsewhere. And it's a property that is sustained above po both positive and negative flickers. So could it be that the architectural form is the monument to Antarctica? You know, there in the iced present as a premonition and in the ice-free future as a reminder. But this present, apart from its anomalous shadow, is also very kind of problematic. You know, it too is a monument, but I think we could see it or we could join Smithson in seeing it as a monument to reason itself or to thinking itself. And for Smithson in particular to the historic character of reason, or even as we just saw a few minutes ago, to the genealogical character of reason and thinking, that this image actually is a rubble of logic. It looks like an orderly heap. Um, it looks like an orderly structure, but it in fact is you know, a heap of uh, rubble, it's a heap of logic. And this kind of this 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 structure that um that that Smithson places into the image and that preserves its properties, you know, whether it's in the the present, the iced present or the ice free like our future, uh this this structure is 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 so close to another work of 1966, which is the A Logon, which works with the tension between reason and appearance. This is something that, that became increase, increasingly critical for uh, Smithson. The intellectual or rational grid that we seem to be looking at, you know, the, the Euclidean gnomons, you know, the, the L shapes, um, the you know, so gradated uh, L shapes, that can only sustain its rational form by phenomenological distortion of its elements. So in order to have the rational form, in order to maintain the, you know, the, the rational sequence, visually, the metric of the, uh, of the structure has to change. This is something that occurs visually in a logon. And for, for Smithson, this is an a logon. This is a challenge to reason. This is a, um, a, a point where reason you know, does not work with you know, what is or kind of what appears. You know, it can only sustain its form by distortion of its elements. And this is a, a, you know, a property that I think Smithson put most elegantly um, in his Spiral Jetty essay. So this this is uh, this will be um, kind of six years later, um, but it's a uh, it, it, it's a fascinating um, it, it's a fascinating version of this thought that that Smithson ha has, and it's a thought that you know, argues that we have to think differently, kind of with if we're to think geologically, and that we have to allow our thoughts to be as if you know they they are um, geological. This was the, and this is a, a wonderful passage kind of from. Uh, you know the um, you know the spiral jetty, jetty essay, where you know he he's almost addressing this scene. I mean his his descriptions of um, you know Roselle Point kind of are almost descriptions of uh, Antarctica, you know, where he says the site gave evidence of a succession of man-made systems mired in abandoned hopes. Uh, it sort of gives a feeling for what's happening uh, uh, on the on the Antarctic Peninsula there, but the. The way that he tries to think about this is is in terms of a surd or an a logon or something that just doesn't work when reason confronts itself with uh, um, a particular a reality, and he says the rationality of a grid on a map sinks into what it is supposed to define 
logical purity suddenly finds itself in a bog and welcomes the unexpected event. The curved reality of sense perception operates in and out of the straight abstractions of the mind. And I think what he means there is that we, are, we live on a globe, so therefore our perceptions are curved, and we make enormous efforts to correct those curved perceptions by rational abstractions. And that this is, you know, again, one of those Abandon, this will become one of those abandoned hopes, one of those man-made one of those man-made systems to be abandoned. And you know the A logon. I mean, we could almost say that these images are you know, monuments to uh, A logica, in a way. The A logon is you know, uh, you know such a you know, a heap of you know, desolate rubble. Um, so in in the in the Antarctica. So the logos or reason itself appears in that um, geometrical structure as a logon, you know, precisely by remaining constant across the flicker between past and future. The thinking will not change, but that will render thinking irrelevant or you know, ineffective. You know, it, itself, it itself does not change. So the art here, or Smithson's art in this work shows a kind of future geology. But what I think Smithson's trying to help us to grasp is that it's not only the geo, the earth, that is changing, but also the, the logos, the reason that has to change with it. It's not possible for one to hold and to grasp the change of the other. It too must change. And this, I think, moving towards an end, this, this kind of takes us towards the, you know, what a possible climatological imperative might be. And this might be, you know, uh, stimulated by, uh, you know, Smithson's challenge, you know, in the monument to Antarctica. This climatological imperative must be to change the ways we think and understand climate change. That, uh, you know, our, our thinking has to find a way to change with the changes in the earth. And you know, the conversation earlier between uh, Wayne and Johan uh, kind of really firmed up a, a suspicion I've, I've always had, which is that scientific thought might not be the best way of, of doing that. You know, they, you know it, it may just produce data anesthesia. It may just be trying to to you know, produce you know, or to sub submit um, qualitative changes to a kind of quantitative you know, grid. And that would suggest that other ways of thinking um, will come through through art. And I think Wayne's Wayne's work is a is is is, a, is an outstanding uh, example uh, of that. So could end with a you know, maybe a reply to uh, to Greta saying, well, it's not enough to listen to the science, but it's also very important or also should be an imperative that we look very carefully at the art and learn from how they understand the meaning of these changes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. If you can just stop sharing um your screen we've seen the images it was it was loud and clear it was so easy to follow you uh so elegantly presented um not just the content but actually how you guided us through through this context and then the specificities of the of the artworks uh thank you so much for this um i'll i can ask a few questions uh, I, I invite the audience to to pose questions in the Q and A uh, if they still have energy uh, to do that. Um, and and also I I welcome panelists to join in if if they're here. I see Wayne is here, and uh, if Johan is still uh, able to join or Bruce, I know it's it must be um, crazy time around there. Professor Moro is here. 
Um, so Howard, if you can still just figure out how to stop sharing the screen, uh, oh, so thought, that we can... yeah, I thought that had happened. But, uh... See all of you. There should be. Um, oh. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Um, I guess I, I'll just jump in, and it, just because you started with the with the notion of climatological imperative, this was just my mischievous concoction, uh, personal uh, thing that I threw yeah. that in because we we speak of imperatives in the history of philosophy. Uh, on the other hand, I feel like there shouldn't be any imperatives or absolutes. But then if there is any, I would say it's the climatological. But I, I thought that in the beginning you said you're slightly critical of that uh, formulation. Uh, and in the end, you you so yeah. clearly present that Smithson work speaks to that. So I was just curious, what is the critique if there is a critique of that particular term? Well, I think I think I was uh, I, I would have been worried by the term if it was being used as you know trying to give an ethical supplement to mm. you know, scientific uh, you know the scientific data and information that is to look to ethics to somehow you know, deal with this terrible you know, recklessness or deficit concerning uh, you know kind of climate futures. So I think that was my my reticence about it. But there is something mm. there is something nice about the, you know, the notion of an imperative or yeah you know, an imperative as a call to thought really, which is mm. something that Smithson's so good at. I mean, it, most of his writing is in the imperative. You know, it's very mm -hmm. much trying to shake up. You know, or trying to uh, dislodge the sediment. You know that uh, you know that that we think with. Yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely, I'll let uh, uh, Wayne jump in. Uh, You've been invoke, invoked a few times here, if you have any comments or questions. Well, well, I mean, I thought that was fascinating. I mean, this kind of idea that you were talking about there um, um, sort of resonates with this idea of, of um, you know, what's essential in this conversation that we're, you yeah. know, we're having. I mean, there's a lot of noise around these things. And some, you know, the subject of climate change has become quite sexy in cultural discourse, but actually yes. it's, I'm, not, it's, I'm not convinced that everyone actually um, is grounded in, in the kind of, you know, what yeah. we're talking about here. And, and um, from my own kind of perspective, I'm quite interested in, in kind of the poles and, and questions of poles and polarity, because I, I think it's an ambiguous question. In, 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 in many ways, it's an ambiguous, it's not an either or, um, to, to whether it's a question of science or whether it's art. I like the idea that you can ground your production or thinking and making in something that's scientifically grounded. Yeah. But I, also, I am also aware that the best scientific advances have been made from being thinking laterally. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Bass uh, were, were able to make advances the understanding of the ozone layer simply because they were able to rethink what the data was telling them. The data wasn't making sense, but they essentially thought creatively with the data to kind of figure out that we now have this thing called, you know, there must be something else happening, which we now call the ozone layer. So, this idea of division, whether rationality and and kind of irrationality or, or creativity and 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 or, or, or logos, uh, is an interesting one because I think that what 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 what's what seems to be clear is that um, um, the language around in which we kind of or the discourse around uh, 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 the, these issues needs to be located somewhere. I think the problem is is that when we have no location for this discourse, yeah. um, it, it, then it becomes, and it's interesting that you were talking about the planetary. Uh, I was fascinated by that because, you know, Smithson was able to do that in a way that, uh, for example, this idea of how thought could be crystallized, uh, yeah. or it, that's the impression I get, that his kind of choice of imposing, um, you know, um, um, a kind of collage of, in his proposal for a monument of Antarctica, this idea that, scale is important as well and, and the idea that you can collage an american naval operation in antarctica 
showing mm. human beings at the scale of ants being, you know, pulling boats or equipment towards yeah, the shore. Yeah. Kind of idea that um, it's unclear why the boats are being pulled or, or what the task of the humans are here. Yeah, you know, yeah. what is the human and non-human kind of relation going on? Yeah, I think yeah. that's what's yeah. interesting. And yeah. the idea yeah. that the kind of um, hexagonal crystal system of ice can be interpreted as a representation of the discourse or scaled up particle of Antarctic ice cave. And yeah. this kind of idea of um, an, uh, and Antarctic being this desert of ice and actually there being a kind of desert of political will to achieve yeah. what's needed to actually look at the poles and polarity and see how significant they are. Because yeah. Yeah. Like I, I was suggesting that, 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 that if you want the evidence or the kind of logos of it. You only have to look at the Arctic and that, because here it's most clearly marked. It's not ambiguous. Yeah. Though. It's no, very no, no. clear. Yeah. The yeah. needed information that we, we know where to get it. Yeah. But what I think there isn't an economic model or will or desire to actually do something about it. And this is what um, my exhibitions, I, I feel like the, 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 in terms of the kind of governing powers of, of, of who have the ability to coalesce some of these warring polarities yeah, yeah. Uh, are, 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 are unable to do so due to self-interest in my opinion yeah. i mean i think uh, that's fascinating and i mean for me it also you know i mean you were mentioning earlier the the theme of violence and you know kind of you know i, I get a real sense of your from your work that that is never very far away from uh, your you know your reflection and it's 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 really fascinating to look at the distinction between the arctic and the antarctic the two different ones you know that somehow and I, I i've never quite understood how you know the antarctic treaty kind of made you know the you know the the continent into something that is kind of separated from the other you know, the other you know or, or geopolitical struggles got to have has to happen in a highly figural way you know it's not the same whereas the the arctic is almost like the opposite so you you have a polar opposite between the poles and in the I, arctic you, you have characters like uh, teller you know who you know, the environmental warfare here he he wanted to detonate h bombs in the arctic in order to clear the ice in order to open up a uh, um a, you know a, a safe sea passage well you know, if you, well, if you think of, if you think of, I mean, one of the things that I was sort of suggesting is of temperature. If we look at temperature and heat. Now, the yeah. Arctic, as we know, is um, um, uh, um, ice surrounded by land, whereas the Antarctic is land surrounded by 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 water. And if you think of the 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 advances in optical cabling within the internet and the kind of necessity to cool our servers that we use on the internet, for example. Yeah. And if you think of the thawing in the Arctic, and now we're moving very dangerously close to the bottom of the Ant of the Arctic, to laying these fiber optic cables. So, for all the speed of advances and technological desire, um, which which we all need, one has to think about the consequences of of the kind of production of not the, not just temperature at the political level, but just on the more kind of practical level. That for, for for all of the kind of you know we all are complicit in this kind of conversation about you know warming for example yeah. and, and and the production of heat it's not just a kind of you know um, um, it's not just a kind of climate discussion in that sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. for every advance that we make and for, for the speed with which we kind of consume and produce yeah, and circulate yeah. um, uh -huh. the discourse we produce something that has to be cooled. And That's unfortunately, right, yeah. the Arctic has become that that repository, or in fact, battleground, yeah. that has become increasingly dangerous. And 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 I and you know one of the wonderful things about the Antarctic Treaty, which was mm. set up in the geopolitical uh, year of 1959, was that it was yeah. one of the most incredibly successful treaties yeah. that people have actually stuck to. So I would argue that that is a rare example of a treaty yeah. which people have actually bonded to, irrespective yeah. of national bound, of national or international boundaries. So it's yeah. interesting yeah. that you, you, you should discuss that treaty because I think that's a wonderful example, the only example where where, right. where where we've been able to kind of have a grown-up conversation. Yeah, 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 and yeah. The, idea, the treaty, the settled second article of that treaty, um, um, states. That information must be used freely uh, mm. amongst the the, the, the global uh, body, 
And yeah. I think that has been respected and 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 and, and is 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 the most powerful example of a a, a point where um, humanity has got together and been able to kind of get get it right. Yeah, I think it's it's often we yeah, often underestimate achievements like uh, kind of that treaty. Um, but I was really fascinated what you're saying about uh, kind of heat there, Wayne, as well, because yeah, you know, of course, physically heat is the degradation of energy. You know, so um, you know, we're we, you know, we're into a whole thermodynamic kind of scenario there, which is that as as the heat kind of rises, the ability of energy to do work is deteriorating, or or rather, the deterioration of the, the ability to do work is 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 heat. So right. at a certain point, you know, I mean, then the inventors of you know uh, thermodynamics kind of believed there would be a heat death of the universe, and basically nothing would ever happen in the universe because the universe would just become heat there'll be no energy left no 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 work can be done i know yeah. but there's a further paradox in the sense that if you accept the second law of thermodynamics that energy can neither be created or destroyed if you think of the sea ice and the disappearance of it the rapid the slow accumulation and rapid disappearance of it um you could argue that sea ice is is is, is in the fact that it governs uh, therm of uh, global temperatures that is it's significantly more important than any political discussion the, yeah. in fact without yeah. it we would global circulation of heat which the oceans regulate in the southern, yeah. southern, yeah. southern hemispheres would not be possible and in, in fact could be um that circulation of global temperature would could be foreshortened or discircuited as a result of that disappearance of sea ice itself so I think yeah. these things are quite important when we when we when we talk um, superficial uh, uh, talk about material and, and matter and meaning. Yeah, we yeah. remember that actually there is a these things have a function. Without yeah. sea ice, we wouldn't that that reflection of heat and that transference of heat above and below the surface of the earth would not happen in the same way. Yeah. So I think we have to be mindful when we start talking about um, some of these other aspects, which have nothing to do with. Um, a shared kind of um, um, uh, discourse. Yeah, I mean, they're, I would think they're reminding us that we live in a we live in a dangerous place, and you know, we live crazily near to a star, you know, which uh, is is definitely not sensible. Um, and also, I mean, the you know, the thermohaline current is uh, you know, is extraordinary. I mean, I've actually started getting nervous the last couple of months with the heavy rains, you know, because of course, you know, heavy rains around. January, February, March, are one of the signs of a deterioration of the Atlantic thermohaline current. You know, yeah. hopefully, hopefully they're being caused by something else. But the but, thing is, we, we talk about these things as if, um, because we're, you know, maybe in the Northern Hemisphere, but yeah. irrespective, if you look at indigenous cultures where their lives depend on these things, whether they eat or not, for example, yeah. the seasons of, for hunting and for, for, you know, the contract they have with nature, as they describe, yeah. Is is severely compromised, and if we, if if you know, it's it, from our pri privileged position or distance from it, and if we if we start to rethink of 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 how for centuries um, indigenous cultures have navigated some of these complexities quite 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 respectfully, um, and if you could think of their contract with nature as, as Michel Serres discusses, and and if they honour that, and that they can then feel that that food or source of nourishment could be, uh, um, you know, recirculated. Um, I think we've just broken that contract. And, yeah, and, I, yeah. and I think that then perhaps there needs to be some kind of amelioration of that contract again, that yeah. I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't seem to be able to come from any sort of political domain. Yeah, yeah. Or even juridical. I mean, which is strange, given that if we're talking about contracts, you know, where is the court, you know, that is it going to be able to adjudicate? You know, between uh, you know those those you know those broken contracts. You know, I, I know Ursula Beeman's work in um, in forest law. She tries to you know almost celebrate you know, the the appeal to kind of the inter American court as being a way of you know kind of addressing you know breach of contract, um, you know the social contract with explicit reference to uh, Ceres, but it doesn't feel a very reassuring you know, uh, you know example. Of, of that. And well, I, I think we'll come to a point where, yeah. out of necessity, let me, as, let me uh, interrupt here. Sorry, Wayne, just to, to give uh, space to another question here as well. We, in, in, 
in two weeks we're actually this is all a great, great springboard in, in next two in two weeks in the third uh, summer in the series we're actually having indigenous perspective uh three act three more or less uh, addressing these issues directly so it'll be interesting to to hear what they have to say uh, not just on a theoretical level but actually from the imminent imminently present perspective um, but there is a question uh, from Professor Moro here on the artwork, the detail in the artwork itself. Simonetta, do you want to ask or, or do you want me to read it? Sure, yeah. thank, you. thank you, Dan. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Howard and, and all of you for this wonderful presentations. Um, I do like how it's wrapping up in a way that is anticipating the next uh, session, which is also the last of this cycle, and in a way is bringing us back to what Bruce Glavovich was um, sort of adumbrating uh, last week when he was talking of the truth and reconciliation process, right? So in yeah. juridical terms, what could that mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Bruce is still here, but uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's certainly something that comes to my mind. Uh, what I was wondering, and, and maybe it's just an idle question, but um, I love the way you interpreted the works, uh, you know, seeing you reading those images and also the way you interpreted the title of um, the apparently misspelled title. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I, I had not thought about this idea of uh, anti-art or, or, you know, yeah. non-art. Um, when I when I first read the title, I thought I thought the word anarchy yeah. And, yes. And I'm sure yeah. Maybe that crossed your mind, uh, but yeah. I was wondering, could um, an article stand for the the anarchy of art? Right. Yeah, I think it's, that's a that's well, a lovely question. Yeah, I mean it, it, and I think it would be consistent with the way that the Smithson was thinking uh, about these things. You know, because I mean the you know the arcane anarchy is you know a it's it's both an archive. It's what it's what is remembered, but it's also a system of rule. You know, so it's like the monarch or, you know, the oligarch, you know, so, uh, you know, the anarch is, you know, there is no, there is no precedent, you know, so there's no archive that you can draw on and there is no ruler who can base their rule on, on an archive. So an article would be kind of, you know, almost like putting, what would be like Smithson in, you know, the height of his avant-garde, you know, enthusiasm, you know, in the, in the mid sixties kind of saying, yeah. well, actually, here we have an art that is beginning again, you know, uh, yeah. we don't need anything precedence or rules yeah I, I agree with you uh, but and yet you can all also say that uh, you know works like spiral jetty and these things happened at a time of the moon landings and of the sort of te first yeah. televised kind of yeah. ideas and this kind of idea of looking at time as a spiral of looking downwards on the jetty perhaps would be looking backwards yeah. both backwards to geological time but also looking forward to a kind of future planetary so in that way i would say it's it's a kind of you, you could argue Smithson was prescient in his kind of uh, kind of radical thinking about how we consider uh, the significance of, of these things. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're, that's, that's absolutely right, Wayne. I agree with you with that, with that as well. And I think the dating is, is interesting because the, um, although we, you know, we tend to think about Earthrise and the 68, you know, image, but the first one, you know, the one that shocked Heidegger, uh, was 1966, and it was a completely robotic. I mean, there's a mad history to this image, you know. The um, you know the, the sort of the spaced out engineers in the Jet Propulsion Lab kind of realized they had an extra couple of exposures of film from their surveying of the moon for the Apollo program, and they so they said, well, why don't we just do a backflip, you know, with the uh, the surveying module, and then try and see if we can snatch a photograph of the uh, the Earth, which which madly they did. And they caught this photograph. I mean, the way it's been, the way it was edited at the time, the way it worked in in the photograph that they took was there's like two thirds of the image is the moon surface, and there's a little bit of little sort of slice of Earth in the uh, you know in in the left hand you know, sector of space. And within days of this coming down to Earth and going into the newspapers, they reversed it by ninety degrees, and the whole thing had then become Earthrise. And you know, Smithson would have been kind of getting you know having that sort of image in mind you know i think you know it's absolutely correct and i think reacting against it i mean there were there, there, there was a lot of reaction against that view i mean well you know, my favorite i think is harrison's making earth you know say so well, you know, earth is not this thing you look at from outside 
it's kind of mud and shit and you know things that you you put together to get compost mm. you know and, and putting it directly against you know the you know the earth day ideology you know from from the 70s mm. um, but i think i think you're right there's there's something really important about that moment in in the 60s and you know, certainly for smithson Just being mindful of the time. There's a question on time, and I would say just two more, two more questions. Uh, one from the audience, and then I would like to give a la uh, last question or comment to Bruce, uh, especially since he was suggesting uh, uh, a form of reconciliation, if you will. This the quasi court. I don't know what to call it. Uh, Bruce will maybe name it. Uh, that could speak to this um, confrontation and reconciliation. But the first, first the question from the audience, Crystal Brown, uh, there appears to be risk involved in both the positive and the negative imagery. I find that incredibly interesting when thinking about that through the lens of Smithson's writing on the sediment of the mind and the relation to time. I'm wondering how you see time and risk via this inversion it's thanks crystal it's such an interesting uh such an interesting question and i think my you know i probably need to think about it a lot a lot more a lot more carefully but my immediate response is to go you know try to go behind time and risk and to look at the condition of entropy you know that uh you know that that is behind it so you know where you're when you know, when when Smithson kind of describes, you know, this succession of man-made systems mired in abandoned hopes, I mean, he seems to be discussing an entropic, you know, almost an inevitably entropic, um, you know, procedure. You know that there are, you know, that there are hopes and projects which then entropy will, you know, bring down and you know leave abandoned as debris. You know, like just as the the debris of logic uh, is left like that, um, and that then leaves me wondering, kind of, kind of quite, you know, the the risk then is you know is is interesting because it's not it's you know there's there's perhaps even more risk in not doing anything under those conditions than there is in doing something so you know the risky option will be the safe one you know that uh, you know thinking well actually it's better not to try and make this worse you know in a condition of entropy is completely destructive. Yeah. I agree with you um, there, Howard. But, you know, what I think successful, when, I shouldn't use successful, but this one thinks of risk. Um, those those qualities are imminent to, to the work itself. So, for example, yeah. Spiral Jetty might be um, either partially or totally submerged, depending on the entropic qualities of the, of the climate and atmosphere at that particular yeah. time. So you could go to Spiral Jetty at one particular time of year, and you'll see nothing. Or, yeah. uh, you know, famously, Spiral Jetty um, is the color it is because of the algae present in, in this, in this salt lake, in yeah. basalt. And, uh, yeah. But you could, you, that, that quality of, of, that entropic quality of risk and feedback yeah. is, 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 is germane to the work itself. It's not outside of the work. Inter yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's not something imposed yeah. onto the work from the outside of, of, of thought. It's yeah. part of the making. And I think yeah. that, that very rarely do when we have, you know, art science uh, exhibitions are notoriously um, banal in that way, in, in that they, yeah. they sort of have to kind of subscribe to these parameters of funding remits, which don't take into account some of these things, generally speaking, where yeah. you know, that, those qualities that the, the, the question raised um, are often divorced from the making, yeah. um, and 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 I think that's why Smith and and Holt uh, uh, yeah. and, and the work of all the land artists actually yeah. Um, yeah. It's, some of those ideas of risk and of of of, of um, are, are 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 not are, are, um, are found within or at yeah. least posed yeah. uh, um, from within. I think you're right. I find that even in a in an artist like Long, you know, there's a you know, you know, it, this seems like a um, you know, a completely you know, an attempt to sustain a you know, um, you know some kind of you know some kind of control or geometrical imposition, which when when it gets to the nineteen nineties, you know the despair, you know you, you realize that actually the conservative operation that that he's doing was actually the most risky one, 
because when it fails, you know, as it fails, when you know, he just he just realizes that he can never look at a circle, or he can never make a circle because it's always because of the the angular perspective. It's always going to be an oval in some way, and that just leads to complete you know, mad despair in, in in his work. You know, so it's you know I, I think that that's so so interesting when to think about well, kind of you know, how 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 do, how can you live that risk in art, or how can we live that risk as you know, you know inhabitants of this planet. You know, which you know, again, I, I, I always, you know, I just think it's such a dangerous place to live. The quality. I mean, the question is though whether that indexing of risk within an artwork can be felt or read. Yeah. Um, often these things are oblique, uh, um, and and perhaps uh, not on, uh, a bit, you know, not so um, explicit. And I yeah. think where Richard Long and artists like Long and and Smithson historically, if you look at the history of of what might be called earth art or land art. These yeah. things um, are, are quite, um, you know, if you think of the Amer American landscape and the kind of macho use of mechanical tools, those uh, Heiser yeah. and the kind of subtlety of, of long yeah. foregoing all of the machinery and just going yeah. for a walk. But the, simpli yeah. the elegance and simplicity yeah, yeah. Of being aligned by walking in, in, in you know. Oh, it's, and, it's devastating. And, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that simplicity that a British land artists have found, yeah. which flies against the kind of uh, sort of um, crude, perhaps, um, um, you know, brutalist, mecha mechanistic approach yeah. to risk that yeah. you might yeah. find in, in other works. So I'd, I would yeah. say that British land artists, are, because of sheer, we don't have vast plains of Nevada in England. You know, yeah. we, yeah. we simply yeah. don't have that. But yeah. they've had to find other ways. Similarly, people in other parts of the world have had found found nuanced ways or subtle ways of, of critiquing, and of of, 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 of offering forms of resistance, which are dependent on on a, a sort of a, a sort of site specificity, which has not required mechanical huge mechanical cranes that Smithson yeah. might have had in the sixties, which yeah. some yeah. people find offensive. Mm. Yeah. A lot of people do. Well, you, Howard, you also exhibited that uh, subtlety and vulnerability in interpreting the monument as a flicker, which I thought was wonderful, uh, a, a thought yeah. image. That's the risk. I feel like it's in the flicker itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'll let Bruce comment and 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 say a few words uh, in, in light of Howard's talk and then we will call it a day or night or a morning. Thank you, Dion. Um, yeah, just thank you to Elena and to Johan and Wayne and Howard for just an incredible, uh, stimulating, uh, far-reaching and deeply probing perspectives that come together in quite powerful, multi-layered ways. Um, you know, from the kind of chemistry of the atmosphere <laughs> and the, um, the kind of far-reaching implications for how we make sense of the time that we live in and whether a notion like the Anthropocene is adequate for making sense of the moral, political, economic, uh, aesthetic dimensions of life or not is, is has been really incredible. Um, the performative art, um, the, the conversations now, um, and in the context of the theme of the, the seminar um, from inaction to reimagination with this climatological imperative, it really, it really brings us to making sense of the relationship between consciousness, understanding and action. And in many ways, the inaction that we see in the political realm is, is very much action <laughs> in terms of maintaining a status quo of a political and economic elite and a way of being and doing that is fundamentally violent and um, possessive. Um, and and uh, the, the, as someone who's not in the arts or philosophy or poetry, the, the power of those humanities and arts to enable reimagination and action is, is immense and so important. And you know, my comment about uh, moving to a Climate Truth and Reconciliation Commission is prompted by many layers of things, but I mean, one, one of them is that there is no one truth. <laughs> and if there's one thing that, you know, you learn when you engage with indigenous people is that 
you know, an understanding from a Maori point of view, for example, is just fundamentally different to a Western um, perspective on the relationship between people and the world around them and the past, present and future. And and yet it's not enough to reimagine and it's not enough to just engage multiple truths. We've got to find ways of reconciling who we are with each other and with the world around us. And that's where for me the action becomes imperative. And and Wayne, you know, just you mentioned a moment ago the, the term resistance, which I uh, frantically Googling and various things discovered, Howard, that you've written at length on, on these uh, on resistance, for example, and um, what a, an important conversation to continue in the series. And so next week, hearing from Indigenous people just takes us into this, such a wonderful segue into this continuing conversation. And so for me, the notion of a Climate Truth and Reconciliation Commission is in part to challenge the, the status quo, which is centered around an an institutional architecture might in the traditional sciences as a way of kind of giving evidence to policymakers to make rational decisions. And we all around this table know just the, the fundamental flaw of that, that framing of the science society contract. So I think as we continue this conversation um, in, in the coming week, it's going to be uh, fantastic to hear from a different perspective um, and the reconciliation potential that I think is manifest for me in the South African journey out of the ashes of apartheid to a continuing struggle to really democratize and to emancipate is part of the wider conversation because the imperative that we're really talking about goes far beyond the climate logical. It is about our relationship in this incredible fragile blue planet so close to the star. So thank you so much, all of you. Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, to the panelists, to the audience who's still lingering there. Uh, you're really uh, durational performers. Um, I just want to remind you that our next final third session that we've been uh, invoking here will be in two weeks. So not next Friday, but two Fridays for now. You will get emails if you registered for all of that. No worries. Thank you again for your patience. Uh, starting late, there, there's no limit. We went three and a half hours or something like that. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. This was amazing. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll be in touch and cross paths again. Have a good night. Good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay well. <laughs>